Big Mike, Mike Lovin. Some people say I'm unbreakable. My name is Rene Dupree. I'm 33 years old from the Canadian Maritimes. Exactly like it feels like. The entire country is hoping that I come through and represent Canada. So it means the world to me because you know, when you talk about pro wrestling, there's a long, long lineage of great Canadian wrestlers. And when people talk about the history of professional wrestling in Canada, the one name I want to remember is Mike Lowe. It's, 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 it's an honor. It's a great thing, you know. Um, I am Canadian, and I love Canada. Hell, I got the Maple Leafs tattooed on my chest. But if you look at every country, if you look at every wrestler in the world, let's say you look at 100, I'm in that top 100. Look at 500, I'm still in the top 100. You look at 600, I'm in the top 100. And when you really, really look, I'm in the top 10. Now can you tell me that there's a chance that everybody that's in this World Cup is above me? No? Maybe a few, but not all. On any given night, if the world thinks one person is better than me, I look forward to proving them wrong. Why is Rene Dupree going to win the World Cup? Because I'm just that good. Plain and simple. WCPW is in the Phoenix Concert Theatre in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, where eight of the best wrestlers from the Great White North will compete to represent their country in the Pro Wrestling World Cup. Dave Bradshaw here alongside former British heavyweight champion Alex Shane. And Alex, we are getting straight into the action. A first round match between Michael Elgin and Rene Dupree. And Dave Bradshaw, what a first round match it's set to be because as our tail of the tape clearly illustrates, Rene Dupree has the height advantage, Michael Elgin has the, the weight advantage, but Rene Dupree, a second generation wrestler, grew up in this business against a man who's as hungry as they come in the great country of Canada, Michael Elgin. Ladies and gentlemen, the fight this match so interesting is Elgin has really carved a name for himself on a world stage in the Indies. Rene Dupree was the youngest athlete at the time to be signed to the WWE. So you have one man who's taken the very hard path of the Indies against another man who was plucked for greatness at a very early age. Difference in philosophy, difference in stature, all taking place right here in Canada's World Cup. Representing the Maritimes, weighing in at 250 pounds, this is Rene Dupree. Well, as you say, Alex, Rene Dupree, a second generation wrestler, 33 years of age now, and it is now a decade since he was released from WWE. Dupree has been making waves across the Indies in that time and no bigger wave would there be than if he could bring home the Pro Wrestling World Cup for Canada. The pressure for both of these two men because this World Cup tournament is truly a global phenomenon here in pro wrestling. And you have these two to kick things off. Dave, I'm gonna put you on the spot, pick a winner. No, take your finger out your nose, I'm in in this match. You know, just based on Based on his uh, recent successes around the world, I'm going to pick Elgin, but I, I feel uncomfortable doing so because Dupree is such an accomplished technical wrestler. This one is a, is a coin toss. And referee Jimmy Coderi, if he looks familiar to you, that's because he was a big, big time referee in the WWE. The best officials in the world and the best wrestlers in Canada to kick things off in our opening contest. Now, if you're Dupree here, Alex, how do you even begin to try and take Elgin off his feet? Such a such a full base, just an absolute rock of a man. That's a good question. What's your answer? To watch and see what happens. That's the kind of wisdom and insight yeah. you can get from former British heavyweight champion Alex Shane on this broadcast. And Dave, the weird thing was that I have been flown alongside you all the way to Canada to commentate on this, but not the World Cup event in England that was two hours from my house. Free holiday, it's nice work if you can get it. It's obviously the uh, quality of your analysis that we just heard a minute ago is why they've flown you all the way over here. 
anyway, collar and elbow tie up. And you see right there the difference in leverage. Dupree leaning forwards and down. Elgin having to face upwards there. And that leverage was used against Elgin as he's taken into the corner. Yeah, Elgin was trying to use his power to put Dupree in the corner. But as you say, Dupree using that height advantage to twist things round. And uh, this World Cup supposedly fought under high standards of sportsmanship. But this one's getting a little bit heated early on. Elgin is a phenomenally strong human being. You see him in the ring there with Dupree, and you'd be remiss to thinking that Dupree is the stronger, more explosive than these two men, but I would say it's a 50-50 with a man like Elgin. Elgin takes a kick into the abdomen. Shoulder block from Elgin as he comes back, takes down Dupree. And that's that explosive energy I was telling you about. Leaping forearm into the face of the former WWE Tag Team Champion. Rene Dupree was the youngest champion of any kind in WWE history when he won those World Tag Team titles at the age of 19. He's a phenomenon, no doubt about it. And look at what Elgin's got in mind here. But I'm not sure what he's thinking, Elgin leaping over the top. Into a, oh, it's a frog splash, goes for a cover and gets two. I thought he'd taken too long there. But Dupree was clearly stunned from that body slam. It may only be a body slam, but when you're a man the size of Dupree, you're not used to being thrown around this often, and he's going to do it again. Look at this. Look at this strength. Rene Dupree, the best part of 250 pounds, being lifted up like he's nothing by Big Mike. Dupree trying to find a way down. He might do it. Elgin. Getting him back up straight and dropping him down on his back. Incredible power. I have no idea how long that was for because the UK indie fan effect has taken hold here in Canada at just a two. Elgin now starting to test things out, seeing if he can get some pin attempts here on Dupree. Testing out that stamina. Dupree, though, is a finely tuned athlete. Always has been. He's not just a wrestler, by the way. He's a former Canadian national bodybuilding champion. Oh, look at that Inzaguri by the big man. That is impressive. The spring in the legs from Rene Dupree. And as you said earlier, Dupree has been in the business for well over a decade and he is still only 33 years of age. I mean, he grew up in this industry. Every fibre of his genetic makeup has rest him running through it. Well, Dupree has rattled the cage of Michael Elgin with that Inzaguri. Elgin trying to shake the cobwebs off as these two now exchange chops in the middle of the ring. This crowd in Toronto, so raucous. They've been great hosts here in Canada for us as there's a high knee into the jaw of Elgin from Dupree. Yeah, there was an added bit of spite there from Dupree. Jumped up and took that knee, which would normally have been in the midsection, straight under the chin of Elgin. And seated abdominal stretch here. And this is where you really see the size difference. And now it's, I wonder again if this is an example of Dupree trying to slow down that explosive offense of Elgin. He did it with the Inzaguri, now trying to get him into a submission hold, and Elgin was able to power out again. Dupree is going to take a run up here into the corner. He's been oh, caught by Elgin. Oh. Dupree in no man's land. And over the head of Elgin, what a suplex. He threw him like a sack of small potatoes. And Dupree is a big man, as we've already established. And here's that explosive force that is Michael Elgin. Shot on clothesline from Elgin as Dupree goes to the mat. And once more, Dupree is failing here to stop that runaway steam train that is the offense of Michael Elgin. Waistlock and a reversal, then a huge German suplex with a bridge. Oh. Incredible gymnastic ability there for the Brook to hold on for the bridge. Great upper body strength as well from Elgin. And you know the big disadvantage of being in the wrestling business from such a young age is the wear and tear it takes on your body. He may look in amazing physical condition, but you can bet that underneath that muscular physique are years and years of wear and tear on the tendons, ligaments, joints and bones of René Dupree. Elgin goes to the ropes, gets caught by Dupree. Takes a knee into the temple and a side suplex. 
Here comes Dupree again, again taking a run up. It didn't work last time. Second time of asking. Dupree this time with a drop kick into the jaw of Big Mike who goes down. Dupree will go for the cover to advance to the second round and he was just a split second away. Referee Jimmy Cordero is there. His hand came down for that three and at the last nanosecond he had to avoid the course and the path of that outstretched hand. Well, what's Dupree doing here? He's got Dupree is obviously frustrated. He's bringing a chair into the ring, and that's not smart. You get disqualified, you're eliminated from the tournament. Cordaris is taking that chair away, or trying to. Oh, well, that's got to be a disqualification right there. Oh, the high boot into the face of the chair from Elgin. And, well, yeah, referee has it. He's called for the bell, I assume, as you Ladies say, Alex. The referee has called a stop to this contest. Declaring the winner via disqualification, Big Mike Michael Elgin. Well, for a man who's as experienced as Rene Dupree, that was a very, very silly mistake because he has just cost himself his place in this tournament. Well, to me, that looks a lot like Rene Dupree realized the trouble he was in, and instead of being pinned in the center of that ring, he took the odds uh, at the gamble of bringing that chair in, and it cost him. He is out of this World Cup. Well, meanwhile, Michael Elgin is just one win away from representing his country in the finals. He will face the winner of our next match, Frankie the Mobster versus Harry Smith. The winner of that will represent Canada in the finals of the Pro Wrestling World Cup. That's a pretty lame question. You should know, and you do know, actually, since I'm sitting in front of you, and you brought me here to work this little tournament of yours. I'm the Beast King. FTM. I'm Harry Smith, Davy Boy Smith Jr. from New Japan Pro Wrestling. I'm here representing Canada. Absolutely nothing. Whether I be Canadian, Ukrainian, or from Afghanistan, Venezuela, the country doesn't mean anything. The country's a landscape. Every country on this planet is a landscape that I want to fill with a misery. A path of misery to which I'm building day by day. It means the world to me to be representing Canada right here tonight for the World Cup. Mark my words, my family is so important right here in Canada. I'm here to represent that family lineage. I'm here to represent the Hart family and the British Bulldog Davy Boy Smith, my father. Mark my words, I'm going to the top. I'm in it to win it. I'm going to win it. Not because I need to prove anything to myself. Not because I want to be listed as the world's greatest wrestler. No. I'm gonna win it just to make sure that nobody has that joy. Nobody gets that reaction of pure happiness of being the best. I wanna make sure everybody winds up miserable after they lose in that tournament. I'll tell you one thing right now, nobody here tonight can match my size, my ability, and I'm a little bit mean in there. When I slap on one of those submissions, whether it be the sharpshooter, crossface, or whether I pile drive somebody, I'm a nice guy, but I'm here to win this thing by any means necessary. Davey Boy Smith Jr. is a fighter, competitor, world champion grappler. I'm here to kick anybody's ass because I'm the baddest mother on the planet. Well, we're getting ready for our second first round match here in the Canadian World Cup qualifiers. Here's the tail of the tape for Frankie the Mobster and Harry Smith. And we are about to see the appearance of the son of a true wrestling legend, son of the Davy Boy Smith, British Bulldog Harry Smith in the WCPW World Cup. Of course, Smith's father, the British Bulldog, had so much success around the world, and Harry Smith will be the favorite here. But Frankie the Mobster, FTM, with something to prove. Ladies and gentlemen, the following contest is a first round match in the World Cup Canadian Qualifiers. 
Introducing first, from Montreal, Quebec, weighing in at 258 pounds, this is the Beast King, FTM! Well, FTM wearing that intimidating headwear to the ring, and he is no slouch. You know, I, I feel almost uh, bad saying that Harry Smith is the favorite because this man has been a, an Iron Man champion in CZW. He's had titles across Canada in Canadian Championship Wrestling, Northern Championship Wrestling, many others. This is gonna be a real, real test of a man who is part of the Hart Smith dynasty. And without question, the horniest professional wrestler in all of Canada. Thank you, pardon. He's, the horns on his head are huge. And his opponent, from Calgary, Alberta, Canada, Weighing at 250 pounds, this is Harry Smith! Well, Harry Smith actually bears some similarities to Rene Dupree. He's been wrestling from a very early age, in fact, from the age of eight in Harry's case. And of course, like Dupree, had a, a stint in WWE before really having a lot, a lot of success on the independent scene afterwards. But as we saw in our opening contest, Dave, being the most experienced and recognizable athlete in this tournament isn't always an advantage because FTM, just like Michael Elgin earlier, is hungry and wants to make an even bigger global name for himself against a more established, more experienced opponent. Much like his father, Harry Smith has had some of his best success in tag team wrestling. He was a, a tag team champion in WWE and more recently in New Japan Pro Wrestling. But looking to really uh, what, get what would be the biggest singles accolade of his career if he could bring home the Pro Wrestling World Cup for Canada. What would you call a tag team between Harry Smith and Rene Dupree, the French man? French, French Bulldogs? The Br British Bullfrogs. Oh, goodness sake. Yeah, because they're French. Yeah, I get it. Well, FTM is uh, trying to surprise Smith here with an explosive start, but a forearm will slow him down. Smith goes to the ropes and a drop kick. And Harry Smith has been on a, a crash diet recently. He has been getting in incredible shape. Uh, tr MMA training, and you can really see the difference. Look at the strength and speed of Harry Smith. I mean, this guy was formidable as a force anyway in pro wrestling, in my opinion, but losing those extra pounds has just made him so much quicker, so much more explosive, and FTM is feeling it right here on the concrete floor. Yeah, Smith has adopted the running power slam of his father as his own finishing move, and that was almost a variation of that that sent Frankie down to the mat. You saw Frankie's back arching backwards as he writhed in agony. Smith sends uh, Frankie lower back first into the corner of the ring apron. And you're seeing why muscular definition on the lower back is so important. As a man who recently slipped a disc in his back, let me tell you, Dave, that is extremely painful. And that's the reason that wrestlers work so much on that lower back, because it takes such a pounding. And if, it, if that had happened to a normal person, Dave, this one would be over. But these are not two normal men. The, let me finish. Sorry, go on. They're two men qualifying for the Canadian leg of the WCPW World Cup. Now you can go. Well, I had to wait for you to say that. We know that already. Goodness sake. Well, I was going to say that Smith is using that camel clutch again, trying to uh, add some pressure to that lower back. And that is an example of the uh, pedigree of Smith that he's been brought up in that technical style by the by Stu Hart, by Bruce Hart, by his own father, knows exactly how to hone in on a body part. I mean, when you grow up as a member of the Smith and Hart family, you literally couldn't have a better education when it comes to catchers, catch can, technical ground-based submission wrestling than that. I mean, they are like the royal family of in-ring competition. Smith with a snap suplex on Frankie. Side press, look at him hooking his arms behind there. And that snap suplex shades of, of course, his dad's tag team partner, another man who made waves starting with his career from England going over to Canada and then becoming a huge star and WWF tag team champion, the legendary dynamite kid Tommy Billington. Of course, Harry Smith has a lot of roots in England, but he is a Canadian, grew up in Calgary. 
But no roots on his head, he's died all of them out. It's very blonde. So, go for the neck breaker here is Smith. He gets it. Wow, with authority as well. Frankie is in trouble here. He's barely been able to get going in, in the first few minutes of this one. He prefers FTM. FTM. Why? Well, because if you call someone Frankie the Mobster, that's just a recipe to get arrested. FTM is like a code. He's, he tries to be conspicuous, as you can tell by the giant horns he came to the ring with. It's a really clever code. It's just the initials of the words. But anyway, Smith is uh, trying to wear him down. FTM. Got those elbows into the, the stomach of Smith, but Smith... Oh, went to the eyes. WTF. Referee is not happy with that, but he's going to let this one keep going. It's a warning, though, for, for Harry Smith. And let's not forget the winner of this has to face Michael Elgin in what will probably be just about an hour's time. If you're Elgin watching this, Alex, who would you rather face in the second round? That's a good question. I mean, if I, if I wanted a, a world-renowned uh, caliber match, I'd want Harry Smith. But the punishment FTM's taken, I think if I wanted to advance, I'd want him. Could be more punishment here because Smith is going for, I think, a power bomb. And it's a straight for the FTM, which is able to backdrop him out of that situation. OMG. What is it with your acronyms today? Well, he's at FTM. I'm on brand, on topic. For goodness sake, here we go. FTM going to the second turnbuckle. Smith to his feet, but not for long because there's a missile drop kick. And now the cover. From Frankie, he gets two, but he only gets two because Smith gets the left shoulder up. Again, every minute longer this goes on, there's an extra minute that Michael Elgin has to recover and that the eventual winner of this one doesn't have. Big back elbow there by Harry Smith, comes off in a lariat, but FTM still standing. Wow. And this is where the, the strength, the power of FTM is going to be a match for Harry Smith in a way that most of Smith's opponents aren't. Oh, he caught the leg, spins back around and finally he takes him down and turns him inside out. Nearly knocked his head off his shoulders, but is it enough to go to the second round? Not quite. Highly competitive match here between FTM and Harry Smith. And it needs to be competitive, Dave, because some of the best wrestlers in the world have already qualified. Men like Zack Sabre Jr., Will Ospreay, Penta, L0M, and of course, Rey Mysterio, all waiting in the wings, qualified in this World Cup. They're all going into the uh, last 16, which will be a tournament at the end of August as Smith goes for a cover again. And once again, FTM gets that shoulder up. Yeah, absolutely. The, the list of competitors that is growing by the week for that final tournament in this Pro Wrestling World Cup is nothing short of jaw dropping. It's OTT. Can you stop? Oh, is he going for that? I thought he was going for that delayed suplex, shades of his dad, but instead, and possibly even worse, he's taken FTM to the top rope. Well, Harry Smith is clearly looking to end it here. And if he lands what I assume is a, a superplex attempt, you've got to think it will be over. FTM is fighting though, he knows the jeopardy he's in. Is that a bite? I think he was maybe bit in there. The ref didn't get a clear look at it by the, by the looks of it as he... Oh, Blockbuster Netbreaker! Goodness me, cover! This could be a huge upset! A huge upset! And two, was it, oh, just he two. did. Harry Smith kicked out. But I mean, he would... That was a, a, it wasn't a lackadaisical kick out, that was a kick out from a man whose vertebrae has been compressed and his nervous system is clearly stunned. I mean, that was, that was more of a, a roll out of desperation than a kick out. Yeah, it wasn't exactly emphatic, was it, from Smith? And Smith looks like a man who is out on his feet. FTM smells blood here. Go for that choke bomb, the credibility statement, he calls it. Oh, the low blow from Smith, ref didn't see it. That's a, a shortcut from Harry Smith. Oh, that kick to the never regions. Well, Smith pleased with himself. Surprise at Harry Smith. Dave, that's not a power bomb. That's a pole driver, center of the ring. If he hits this, this one is over. Oh my God. The skull of FTM oh. bounces off the canvas. 
That's two. That's three. And Harry Smith advances to the Where second the round. Stop Harry Smith. Well, impressive showing there from FTM. But you know what that means, Dave? We are going to see Harry Smith against Michael Elgin in the second round. What a match that's going to be. It was impressive, but I'm disappointed in Harry Smith that he took a shortcut there to pick up the win as FTM was gaining momentum. Not a tactic that is worthy of his lineage. In any case, though, Harry Smith will advance, as you say, Smith versus Elgin in the second round of these Canadian qualifiers, the winner will go on to the finals to represent Canada. More first round action coming up in just a moment. I am Brent Money Banks. My name is Speedball Mag Bailey. I'm a fourth degree black belt in Taekwondo. I'm an artist, I'm a fighter, and I love to do this. Tonight, I'm gonna to prove to the whole world what I usually say to everyone anyway, but tonight I'm gonna to prove what I am, money, and it's about time that Brent Money Banks takes his talents overseas to England and shows that side of the world why I truly have money. It's an active goal of mine to wrestle in as many countries as possible to represent Canada like so many other greats have represented their own countries traveling all over the world. And this Canada Cup falls directly in what I want to do with wrestling. I want to show the world what happens in Canada. Why will Brett Money Banks win this tournament? That's a very good question because who am I getting in the ring with tonight? Speedball Mike Bailey, the Karate Kid. Listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk into that ring, I'm gonna slap that kid around, I'm gonna definitely sweep the leg, I'm gonna break it in half, and then I'm gonna move on to the next round. For anybody else who wants to step into the ring with Brett Money Banks because tonight's all about money, and I'm taking this worldwide. You know, I don't think I'm ahead of the others. I don't know that I'm going to win this. I never approach situations that way. I know I'm well trained. I've proven myself in the ring several times. I know I have what it takes to win. I don't know that I'm going to win. I'm going to have to prove to myself and everyone else at the same time, one match at a time, why I'm going to win. Time for our third first round match in these Canadian qualifiers. This could be a high-flying encounter, Alex, between Mike Bailey and Brent Banks. And I'll tell you what, one man I've been looking forward to seeing in the flesh right here in Toronto is Mike Bailey. Because if you've not heard of him before, trust me, you will remember his name by the end of this. Taking nothing away from Brent Banks, but this one may just be a show stealer. Such a variety of different styles in these Canadian qualifiers. I promise you this one will be very different to the first two matches you saw. I'm excited for this. Well, I'm also excited, if not somewhat exhausted. I spent the entire afternoon going around Toronto looking for the Sky Dome. It's, it's not even called the Sky Dome anymore. It's, no one, it's pretty easy to find. The Rogers Centre, no wonder Hogan got confused. The following contest is a first round match in the World Cup Canadian qualifiers is scheduled for one fall. Introducing first, from Montreal, Quebec, weighing in tonight at 185 pounds, Speedball Mike Bailey. Mike Bailey. As you said, I is one of the world's most exciting young talents. And as you can see, he's demonstrating here, an expert in Taekwondo. Very much martial arts influences in his style as you're gonna see here. And this guy can fly. He's got like springs for kneecaps. What? Springs for kneecaps. I mean, not literally. I'd hope. Bailey in the ring and we await the arrival of his opponent. And his opponent from Toronto, Ontario. Weighing in at 194 pounds, he is the One Man Dynasty, Brent Banks! Brent Banks, an 11 year veteran who's uh, had a lot of success across the independent scene, particularly in Canada. Mike Bailey, for his part, of course, been very successful in Canada as well, but also had uh, a lot of 
victories in CZW, Combat Zone Wrestling in the US, and he's been over to the UK for such promotions as Rev Pro. So, Bailey perhaps a slightly better traveled, but nonetheless, as you say, two very well matched young men. And Brett Banks has something very big in common with Doug Williams. What's that? Neither of them are related to Travis Banks. Allegedly. Tell that to WCPW Creative. No one would admit to being related to Travis Banks, I don't think. I'm excited for this one, Dave. Look at the uh, stretching here from my, Mike Bailey. I was going to say, my nipples look like FTM's helmet. That's how excited I am. What? Well, oh, just don't point them this way. All right, we're getting underway. Bailey and Banks, and listen to this crowd. These two are such favourites of fans across Canada. And you know what that is, Dave? Because these guys have made a habit and a living of tearing the house down when they compete. Well, these two are very much enjoying this reception from the fans, but things are going to get serious here in just a minute. And if I can liken these two to anyone, and I'm probably going to get crucified for saying this, but it's Ricochet and Will Ospreay. Well, Those two guys who have just set a new standard. But the exciting thing about this, it reminds me of matches like the first time I saw Rey Mysterio in the ECW arena, or when I saw Guerrero Malenko in the ECW arena also. To most of the people watching this show, these will be two completely new talents, and they know that this will be the most watched match that they have ever had in their career and I guarantee they'll pull out all the stops and similar to those guys I mentioned before they will leave your jaw open and may just go on to do great things it's uh, a great showcase for the Canadian wrestling scene is this you know the British wrestling scene was in a similar position a few years ago with lots of great talent but not quite the exposure it felt it deserved now of course the British scene has exploded the Canadians feel like, you know, they're every bit as talented, but they don't quite get the stage to perform on. And talking about that great talent, it's not all about the World Cup on this show, because we will see Gabriel Dick Kidd defending his internet championship against the incredible Zack Sabre Jr. And in a non-title match before the end of this broadcast, we will see Joe Hendry take on the Mexican sensation, El Laguero. Yeah, I flew to Canada to escape Joe Hendry, and he's here. Anyway. Let's uh, get underway with this one. Jimmy Corderas is getting uh, a bit of love as well. He's got the most Twitter followers in this match. That doesn't mean anything, does it? What world are you living in, Dave? The Social media footprint is all. You are so insecure. I'm like a digital media Sasquatch hunter. What? There's a footprint reference. A f I give up. Bailey and Banks finally looking up here. Banks is going to push Bailey back to the corner. Will we get a clean break? Went to the ropes, rather, not the corner, but he's having a bit of fun. But Banks does deliver the clean break. That's where they come from, is Canada, isn't it? In Saskatchewan. Okay, well, first of all, it's Saskatchewan, and it's got nothing to do with Sasquatches. But can we, can we move on? Colonel Tire into a wrist lock there, so I moved on. That's very grown up of you. Look at this, look at the speed of those reversals from Brent Banks. Wow, and look, wow, my God. Bailey more than equal to it as he's going to get backed into the ropes a second time. Will we get a second clean break from Banks? And smart there, Brett Banks tried to send Mike Bailey off into the ropes. And Bailey was having none of it. Oh, and this time it's Bailey playing the mind games. In the end, after looking like he was going to hit Banks, offering the handshake. You've heard of the one-inch punch. That was like the one-inch handshake. That was super fast. Bailey with a smirk on his face as Banks is a little bit annoyed that he got outsmarted there. I think he thought he had the psychological upper hand. We're back to square one between these two. Another tile. This time Banks goes behind with a rear waist lock. Bailey gonna counter. And he's taken down as uh, an example there of Bailey's amateur wrestling skills, not just a martial artist, but a great wrestler too. Front face lock there, into a waist lock. And Banks trying to find a way out of it, the taller of the two men. And we may see that a lot in this match, that sometimes the only way to escape the predicament you're in 
is to go to the ropes. It's the third time we've seen that. And trust me, before this one is done, that won't be the only kind of going to the ropes we're going to see. I'm predicting flying. And not just because I have to leave Canada and go back to England after this. You can go now if you want. My helicopter's not warmed up yet. You can't fly to England in a helicopter from Canada. Well, actually, I'd like you to try. My speedboat is like midway and I refuel. Kick to the midsection there from Banks. Oh, he's slapping there, they're slapping there. There really is this attempt to go Bailey into making a mistake here. Up and over. Second up and over there by Bailey. Going for a third up and over, this time with a backflip. Bailey charges, here's the ropes, comes back, leapfrog. Comes back again, second leapfrog, roll through. Off the ropes, sent pass. Third leapfrog, Dave, I can't yeah, keep up. Yeah, this is incredible stuff. Banks holds onto the ropes, finally. Wow. Goes out. And <laughs> the ability, the mental ability that takes, let alone the physical ability, to think on your feet about where your opponent is in the ring at all times. That was absolutely stunning. The ninjas. Banks has rolled back in. But he knows just how dangerous Bailey can be at high speed. That's why eventually he chose to bail out there. There was more leapfrogs there than an under nines sports day at a school. What? He did leapfrog, uh, potato sack race, egg and spoon. Do you ever win any of those? You can't fix them. There we go. Alex Shane philosophy there in one sentence. As Banks offers a handshake again. Well, that's not a wise decision, is it, after what we just saw? Goes for the kick once again. Went to the well once too often there. Bailey thinks he, he lured him in. He, he may be right because sends to the ropes and reverse of the Irish win. Banks is going to pick him up. Oh. Oh, well, backbreaker. Wow, I mentioned Eddie Guerrero earlier. That was shades of him right there. And now this mounted punches with the left arm from Banks. Banks is uh, building up ahead of steam here. He's going to send Bailey to the ropes again. Knee into the into the abdomen sends uh, Bailey reeling to the canvas. Interestingly, Bailey tried to alleviate some of the pressure from that knee to the midsection by flipping forwards, but that knee was buried so deep that he attempted to extend his body and just collapsed it as a as a heap on the floor. So some way of illustrating the force of that knee. Winner of this one's going to face the winner of our next match, which is Tyson Dukes and Kyle O'Reilly in the second round. As Banks backs Bailey into the corner, big chop across the chest. And the, uh, the psychological game of chess here between these two has been fascinating to watch. Bailey with a chop. And a second one. Again, this is a one-upmanship here because Banks just did that to him. Banks turns it round into the corner. This is a, a contest of who can chop the most now. That would make it two-upmanship. What? Oh, that's, a, that's a slap in the face there. The referee not happy. I think it was a poke to the eye and Bailey returned in kind. Both of these two determined to match each other to go one better. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man, man is king. No idea what that means, but it might be relevant here. It sounded wise. Oh, oh. Drop kick from Banks. Wow. Look, wow. That was that was like watching a headnip version of Michael Jackson doing that weird thing in Moonwalker where he flipped sideways. He nipped up onto his feet and kind of bridged in midair. Did anyone else notice that? Is that just me? Yeah, incredible skill there from Banks but now he's showing the other side of his character there's a slightly cocky element to Brent Banks Dave if I could move like that I'd be cocky about everything you are cocky about everything I'd, I'd brush my teeth cocky I'd flush the toilet cocky what have you got to be cocky about after going to the toilet I'm not going to answer that I think we should focus on the match oh, well, yeah. getting distracted It'd be a first for you look at this yeah, Banks with those repeated stomps between the shoulder blades of Bailey. He is eliminating the competition, not just in this tournament, but, you know, for the accolades and admiration of the Canadian fan base. These guys are very, very similar, in my opinion. They're at the same place in their career. And as we found out, wrestling is incredibly um, competitive when it comes to getting those big money contracts and that high-profile main event spot. See, the danger here, though, I think, for both of these guys is they want to obviously leave it all out there in this first-round match and 
try and impress a global audience, but if you win, you've got to have conserved enough energy to give yourself a chance in the second round. Bailey, again with the chops, he's going to send Banks to the ropes once more. Reversal by Banks. Bailey going to hold on. Charge there by Banks, and he runs straight into that boot by Bailey. Goes to it again, ducks a clothesline, does Bailey. And a duck of a kick, and what's going on here, Dave? Oh. A drop kick from Bailey sends Banks into the corner. It's more like a one footed karate kick. Yeah, that martial arts influence starting to come through here from Bailey. Leaping, running knee into the jaw. Gonna try for it a second time, maybe. Oh, gets it. Banks is in a lot of trouble. We could be watching the final moments of this one. But Banks moves out of the way. Bailey went to the well once too often. Now Banks is gonna try and do the same thing. Bailey moves. Wow. Spinning roundhouse kick to the side of the head. And you heard that one. <laughs> Trying to finish it there was Bailey, but Banks is uh, replying with some quick strikes. Banks with a forearm to the side of the head of Bailey. You can see the exhaustion trying oh. to set in. Straight between the shoulder blades with that one. Drops him on his face, and what's he got in store here? This does not and look he, good, Dave. Go for that roundhouse kick, I think. Oh, couldn't get it. Misses it a second time. He's put a lot of the best wrestlers in Canada away with that one. And he may put Banks away with it. Because he hit it on the third time of asking me. He didn't get all of it, and Banks got out. The thing is, a kick like that. If you hit it in the right place, it's enough to knock you out. If you hit it in not exactly the right place, it's enough to temporarily stun you. Banks may have kicked out, but you can see he is in a world of trouble right now. This has been building for the past couple of minutes. Bailey has been gradually taking the upper hand here. As you say, that roundhouse kick, not enough to finish him, and that one could go a bit further towards headed that way. And strangely, he's taking the upper hand with both his feet. What? Well, it's more like the upper foot. Okay. Bailey is uh, trying to think now, think how he can finish this after that roundhouse kick didn't get it done for him. Banks pushing him away. Banks is doing anything at this point to try to give himself a reprieve, but Bailey is going to come off the second turnbuckle here, maybe. Leapfrog. Rolls through. Banks is waiting for him. Oh, handspring. Gets caught and Banks slams him down, spinning, sit out, power bomb, and oh my goodness, how close was that? And a big mistake right there by Banks, in my opinion. You see, the reason that I don't brush my teeth cocky or flush the toilet cocky is accidents can happen. It's a horrible fault. But right there, if Banks had been less cocky, he'd have put more effort into that pinfall, and he may just be in the second round right now. Well, even so, he looks like he could just be moments away from it because Bailey, although he was able to get out, is gasping for air like a fish out of water. Bailey gonna, well, he was going to be sent to the outside. He landed on his feet. Banks doesn't see it yet. Now he does. Bailey will get a shoulder thrust into the midsection. Bailey will come off oh. the top. He's been caught. Banks has caught Bailey on his shoulders. Bailey trying to escape, maybe going for a sunset flip. And it gets it. Shoulders down for Banks. There's two, but it's only two. God, this is a great match. Wow. Lee Frogger. Wow. Back flip from Banks. Hold on, hold on. He's not done. Look at this by Bailey. My God. A PK. A penalty kick from Bailey. Shades of Shibata from New Japan. And Banks wisely has rolled out of the ring to give himself another reprieve here, but Bailey isn't going to let him rest. Bailey off the middle oh. of the moonsault. Unreal. Oh. Unreal. My gosh. Remarkable stuff from Mike Bailey. Dave, I made that prediction earlier that this may just be the show stealer. But I'm telling you now, even I'm amazed at this one. These guys pulling out all the stops. They are pulling out stops I never even knew were there in the first place to be pulled out. That's going to be hard to top as this one as Bailey. Bailey's found a bottle of water and wouldn't deprive him of that. Must be absolutely shattered here. There is Banks. Let's get a view of Banks if we can because he must be doing even worse after 
taking the brunt of that impact from that moonsault. There he is. It is, as you would expect, Bailey to his feet first. Bailey is rolling, banks back in. And waiting for Banks to get in position. Bailey, springboard off the top, he missed half, oh, he tripped. Bailey tripped. Okay, Banks a chance, but oh no, from nowhere. Another spinning kick, knocking Banks silly. Oh, oh my, oh, slap from Banks, that's not pretty, that's one way to stop him. And Banks, again, with Bailey on his shoulders, he tried this earlier. Bailey escaped last time. He rams him into the turnbuckle. Look at the way that Bailey's head snapped backwards. Oh, counter, victory roll, victory roll. Is that gonna do it though? Didn't sit back enough, there's a standing moonsault. It was like a standing knee shot. I think he hit with the knee, it's like a, a knee drop to beat him and he didn't get it. Goodness me, this is exhausting to watch. You know, people have said for our pro wrestling, when's the next Attitude Era? What's the next Attitude Era? WWE tries to get across the reality wrestling era. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, Dave Bradshaw, what era this is. This is the independent wrestling era. You're seeing the influence of independent wrestling across every stage in the world. And this is the reason why. Banks with the knee into the jaw of Bailey. Oh, oh my God! My God, what was that from my Bailey? Whatever it was, it wasn't enough! It was a moonsault body slam! Oh, it's corkscrew and a miss! Banks will go to the second rope, get an ace crusher from the top, or from the second rope, I should say. Gonna go for it again. A slice bread, cover. That's gotta be all. That's gotta Surely. be all. That is that's not all. Oh. Kick to the side of the head from Banks. Oh. Takes him down, face first, into the canvas. Is Bailey out? No, he's not. My God. My God. Dave Bradshaw, where else is there left in the entire world of wrestling moves that these two can do to each other that haven't already been done? They are on their feet in Toronto, Ontario. For two of their own, who are showcasing the very best of Canadian wrestling. Banks, once more, going to try and ram Bailey to the corner. Oh, oh, the Canadian destroyer. How apt, how apt indeed, Dave. And look at that. Another spinning martial arts kick from Bailey. Oh, we've seen this, we've heard of this before. Oh, there it is. my God. There it is, the shooting star, Needrop. He's beaten some of the best in Canada with that. And he beats Brent Banks here in Toronto. What Literally a match. Back. Speedball, Mike Bailey! Many people have spoken about the emergence of indie wrestling, Dave Bradshaw. And then the big scene that everybody's talking about now is the UK scene. Well, I'm going to tell you right here in 2017 for the WCPW World Cup, Dave, the Canadian independent wrestling scene has just spoken and its words were Brett Banks and Mike Bailey. My God. Mike Bailey advances to the second round, but the question is, Alex, how much does he have left? He's going to have to face the winner of Kyle O'Reilly versus Tyson Dukes. That match is next, but it is Mike Bailey who advances to the second round. This is, uh, textbook Tyson Dukes, also known as a wrestling machine. I've been at this business for 20 years. I am Kyle O'Reilly and I'm the man that changes everything you thought you knew about professional wrestling. This isn't my first time at this rodeo. This is not my first tournament. This is definitely not my first time representing Canada in a tournament style. I've dropped the ball many times. I've come in and I've expected to do great things and I've always come short. Uh, this time around, I'm, it's, I'm totally focused. I've trained real hard for this. I knew this was coming up and I'm not giving up on this one. You'll have to break my arm. You will have to knock me out to take me out of this thing. Canada is a very long and storied and proud tradition when it comes to professional wrestling. And I treat that with the utmost respect. Now to make my name professional wrestling, I, I had to leave Canada. I had to go where there was opportunity, but to return to my native soil 
and to prove that I am the best professional wrestler in the world and to win the World Cup. Representing Canada means everything to me. The only reason I'm going to win this tournament is strictly because I need redemption. This has been a long time coming. I've seen a lot of failures in my career and I have a lot of atonements to make. It's all because it's all mental attitude and I have not stepped up when I was supposed to step up. This is my opportunity. I'm going to take it 100% and I don't take no for an answer. What makes me think I'm going to win this tournament? Well, frankly, when it comes to Canadian pro wrestlers, there's nobody better than me. And I'm determined to represent my country proud in the World Cup. So for my sake, and for Canada's sake, the World Cup champion, Kyle Riley. Getting ready for the last of our first round matches here in the Canadian qualifiers. It's Tyson Dukes against Kyle O'Reilly. And just like our previous match, this is one I've been looking forward to. If you're familiar with the WWE Cruiserweight Classic, you'll know Tyson Dukes. And of course, if you've been watching any independent wrestling for any period of time over the last couple of years, Kyle O'Reilly is a man who you have been, will have been unable to avoid seeing. So this one is going to be something special in my opinion. Mike Bailey awaits the winner of this one. We will soon be down to four, and only two can advance to represent Canada in the World Cup Finals. The following contest is a first round match in the World Cup Canadian Qualifiers. Introducing first, from London, Ontario, weighing at 205 pounds, he is the Smash Wrestling Champion, the Wrestling Machine, Tyson Dukes! Tyson Dukes, a 20-year veteran, has that advantage over Kyle O'Reilly, and most recently had arguably the biggest year of his career, Alex, appearing in the WWE Cruiserweight Classic, where he lost in the first round to Zack Sabre Jr. And not to mention the current Smash Wrestling Champion. From Vancouver, British Columbia, weighing at 210 pounds, he is the violent artist, Kyle O'Reilly! Kyle O'Reilly, a former Ring of Honor World Champion, and he's also had a lot of success in other major independent promotions around North America, not, to, not least of which was Pro Wrestling Guerrilla, where he was the winner, Alex, of the Battle of Los Angeles in 2013. Guess who we beat in the final, by the way? Go on. Michael Elgin. You can see a repeat of those two men in one place if they end up being the two men who represent Canada in the finals of this World Cup. What I find so interesting about Carl O'Reilly is these long limbs. Just look at the, the length of the limbs of O'Reilly. Reminds me very much in many ways of the legendary Barry Windham. Shinsuke Nakamura is another man, long limbs, very flexible, very hard to get any kind of hold on this guy because it's like trying to put a submission on a piece of Haribo. What? Well, because they're long and they're stretchy and they're bendy. And also they're not gonna submit because they're just a piece of candy. You are so strange sometimes. O'Reilly with the wrist lock. Interestingly, this one started with a collar and elbow tie-up as well. I think all four of these ones, of these uh, qualifiers, have started that way. And look at Carl O'Reilly there with that wrist lock, digging the head into the wrist, keeping close, digging the head in between the shoulder blades. Carl O'Reilly knows exactly how to exert maximum energy and pressure in all these holes. The one count, and look at that from O'Reilly countering into a submission, got that right arm of Dukes floating over but Dukes finds a way out and now he's back to the wrist lock. 
O'Reilly having to try and maneuver himself to try and keep the pressure off that left wrist. Duke's doing a good job here of wearing him down. Now, so I asked you this one with regard to the other half of the bracket, but now that Mike Bailey is in the second round, who do you think he would rather face next? Well, I mean, the big question for me is what kind of condition is Mike Bailey going to be in after the contest we just saw? I think either of these two men would be equally tough competition for him in the second round. Of course, the advantage Bailey has, goes without saying, is that uh, there will be a, a few extra minutes recovery time for him, obviously, thanks to the luck of the draw. I will tell you this as well. But the, the big disadvantage that I think Mike Bailey would have if he's in there with Carl O'Reilly is Carl O'Reilly stays so, so close and a lot of the striking that is used by Bailey would be a huge disadvantage if he didn't have the distance to fully extend his limbs on those strikes. Carl O'Reilly, as I've said it, since the opening bell, he has not lost physical contact with his opponent. That's a great point. And Duke's uh, sent to the ropes by O'Reilly. Shoulder block sends O'Reilly down. And O'Reilly is tendering that uh, left arm, left shoulder a little bit. And O'Reilly, all business, goes back into that corner to regroup. And look at the hole he is staring through his opponent. This guy is focused, motivated and determined to leave here, making his way into the next round of that World Cup. His intensity personified is Kyle O'Reilly. We get another tie up and well, uppercut now from O'Reilly. Such aggressive offense. Even the way he took that headlock, that added twist, it's almost ripping the head off the shoulders of Tyson Dukes. A headlock can be a really effective move if it's done in the way that Kyle O'Reilly does it, but Dukes sent him to the ropes. A stalemate there, neither man goes down. O'Reilly, I think he's being challenged by Dukes to go for that again. And again, Dukes goes nowhere, so O'Reilly gonna switch, goes for the kick, and this time gets Dukes down. More of an explosion behind that shoulder block and straight there. Again, keeping it close. No wasted movement, no wasted offense, no wasted energy by Carl O'Reilly. You spoke earlier about the, the previous contest between uh, it was being like a watching psychological chess. Well, this one is physical chess at its finest. Again, twisting the head on that headlock is O'Reilly to get sent to the ropes by Dukes. Dukes go for a hip toss. O'Reilly held onto the ropes. Clever stuff from O'Reilly, who runs over Dukes. Shoulder roll, and then finally, headlock takedown. O'Reilly is just all business. No finesse. And once more twisting on Dukes. Referee asks if he wants to give up. I don't think Dukes will give up to that headlock, but it will certainly take away a lot of his energy, take away some of that blood flow to the brain. Dukes has got O'Reilly back into the corner. No clean break there, instead of shoulder into the abdomen. And O'Reilly, you're misjudging what Dukes was doing there. Another takedown. O'Reilly counts with a head scissors and we are back up to our feet. Action coming thick and fast. And if you control the head, Dave, you control the body. And that's exactly what O'Reilly's been doing from the opening bell. Talked about how Tyson Dukes was in that Cruiserweight Classic losing to Zack Sabre Jr. Don't forget, coming up in not very long at all, we have got Zack Sabre Jr. here this evening in Toronto as well. He's going to challenge Gabriel Kidd for the Internet Championship. Plus Martin Kirby, yeah, I said it, Martin Kirby makes his Canadian debut on this very broadcast. I'm excited about that. I've got my glow sticks and everything. Oh, please. That's why they got through customs. God, even a headlock from every position. O'Reilly doesn't mind if it's repetitive, if it's working, he's going to stay at it. And it has been very effective, as you say, in controlling Dukes for the past few minutes. Well, that'll help him out. No, it won't. Oh, my goodness. What tenacity from O'Reilly. Well, Einstein said stupidity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So I guess using that metric, genius would be doing the same thing over and over again if it gives you successful results. And that's exactly what Co O'Reilly is doing. Should write a, a scientific success book. 
be a bestseller. Yeah, but you, you could do the forward. That might affect sales, so. O'Reilly has Dukes backed into the ropes. There's that high roundhouse kick that Dukes gets out. And that, Dukes definitely needs to get his breath back here because he's been in that headlock a long time, but oh, O'Reilly not going to let it out. I'm going to name that book Headlock the Deadlock. Because it rhymes. Put in the self-help category. Yeah, you need some self-help. O'Reilly trying to block his part oh, into the ring post. And smart. Then... Well, that might be the opening that Dukes needed to get a foothold in this match as he rolls O'Reilly back into the ring. Again with the head or he shouldn't put his head down there because that gave O'Reilly a chance to go back there. Dukes was trying for a side suplex, I think, but that was a not necessarily the most intelligent thing to do. Forget dot 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 dive, it's dot 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 headlock in this one. Oh, and that will change things. The knee such a delicate part of the human anatomy, you can easily pop that ball out of the socket. He should be Randy Orton's favourite wrestler, Carl O'Reilly. Kyle O'Reilly is a lot of people's favourite wrestler because he is, as we've noted, so uh, business-like, so intense. But Dukes has done a good job now in the past couple of minutes of finding a way to take him down by focusing on that left leg. Well, for a headlock to be successful, at least uh, uh, when you're standing up, you need a wide centre of gravity, you need a wide base in those legs, and that is almost impossible to achieve when one of those legs has difficulty standing. O'Reilly is trying to get those forearms to take out Dukes, but Dukes had him in a very compromising position and it was easy for him to sweep away the other leg. And again, more damage to that left leg. The knee in particular taking the brunt of this abuse. And O'Reilly, this could be trouble for O'Reilly, you know, he's in the middle of the ring. He is screaming in pain. I don't know if O'Reilly can find a way out of this if, if Dukes can continue to cinch down on this hold. And you mentioned earlier that match that Dukes had with Zack Sabre Jr. The most, I would argue, the most watched match Dukes has had. Definitely the most watched match by Dukes because he would have gone back and analysed that tape again and again. It would have been indelibly etched into his mind. And you can almost see the influence of that Zack Sabre Jr. match taking its toll right here on Carlo Riley's knee. He's relentless on that. Zack Sabre Jr. is known as the technical wizard. Well, we've seen some technical wizardry from both of these guys in this fourth of four first round matches in the Canadian qualifiers. And once again, you've got to look to the second round here. Even if O'Reilly can find a way back into this one and somehow beat Tyson Dukes, how on earth is he going to survive against Mike Bailey if he can barely put any weight on that left leg. And that knee pad only gives you padding at the front of the knee. And unfortunately for Carl O'Reilly, the impact of kneecap and steel had no protection on it because it was right on the side. O'Reilly is having to use the ropes to try and get himself back to a vertical base. And Dukes is being absolutely ruthless and continuing to focus on that part of the body. And that kick. Yeah, and again, straight to the side of the knee, not the front, the side. He wants to knock that kneecap straight off. Dukes, elbow and whole body weight for win. Again, you're right on the side. And O'Reilly is almost helpless here. He has been for a couple of minutes. Oh, is he? Oh, no, he's not. Wow. Going for Armageddon, he calls it the cross arm breaker. He's got that, that left leg hooked up as well, so that gives Dukes less opportunity to use his legs to escape. Into the arm breaker, it hyper extends the elbow, but Dukes very quickly and very wisely gets his right ankle onto the bottom rope. That was almost a biblical strategy of offense. Was his Armageddon? Oh. I was wondering why you've gone quiet. Whenever you go quiet, you're thinking of a pun. No, it's always there. That's a scary thing. Dukes has got O'Reilly. Oh, O'Reilly lands on oh. his feet, but look at that. Did some more damage to his own knee and again uses the knee to attack the head of Dukes, but he may have done more damage to himself than to his opponent. Both men down, referee has a count on. This is a 
a chance for both of these guys to get their breath back. They're definitely going to make it up before 10. In fact, O'Reilly is up already. And even when he's kicking with the right leg, just putting his body weight on the left leg is hard for him here. In many ways, kicking with the, the right leg would be worse than kicking with the left. Oh, wow! A leg my, sweep. My word. Incredible stuff from O'Reilly, who is somehow hanging in there in this one. Once again, doesn't have quite enough left in the tank to capitalise on that. He's given Dukes a chance to get to his feet in the opposite corner. O'Reilly will charge it. Dukes running forearm. Now an arm breaker across the shoulder. Side suplex. Oh, got a leg lock now. Wow. Hold up. Oh, I thought it was. Oh, oh Dukes has counted. Wow, he did. It was hard for me to see what was happening there. Dukes was looking for something and he got it. And again, it's that left leg. It's the left leg of Kyle O'Reilly. That is uh, the worst possible type of counter that O'Reilly could have found himself in. In fact, they're both hurting each other and eventually this ends up in the ropes. Once again, a very different style of match to what we've seen previously this evening, but fascinating to watch. As you say, physical chess here between O'Reilly and Dukes. Dukes screaming out as O'Reilly some more kicks and using that right leg. Straight to the elbow. And again, look at that. Oh. And by another arm breaker and gets it. The human arm is not meant to be bent in that way, Dave, and at that speed. Just brutal. These two have inflicted so much damage on each other. Could be easy pickings for Mike Bailey. And O'Reilly kicking straight to that arm. Yeah, and that's a good point, Dave, because Mike Bailey is the only man who's going to benefit from this. And the longer this goes on with every single strike, you've got to think Bailey is looking at this match on a monitor backstage, and that smile on his face must be getting wider and wider. Yeah, they went to go head to head. But for that momentary pause, it was just enough for the adrenaline to wear down just a bit and the pain to start being felt. For a spinning Larry did O'Reilly. Oh. There's a, a cover from, from Dukes. O'Reilly is stunned. If Dukes can get his right arm over him, he can try for the cover here. He doesn't even have enough energy left to do that, though. Referee has a count on again. If he gets to 10 and neither man gets up, then this would be a tie and Bailey would advance via a bye into the finals. And Duke's trying to get that feeling back in that left arm. As is O'Reilly with that left leg. Back to back go both men, they turn around. Oh, and Duke's got the best of that. But the tie drop and a DDT, wow. Duke's rolls through. And Duke's going for the figure four, I think. Oh. And he, look at, yeah, look at that, he's got the, again, he's got that left leg is the one that's hyper-extended. O'Reilly needs to fight with every fibre of his being because he is as far from those ropes as he could possibly be in this submission, and Dukes gets it. As soon as that right leg went down over the opposite ankle, that's added more and more pressure onto O'Reilly. And Dukes knows that he could be moments away here. You know, if O'Reilly doesn't tap out, he may pass out. Such must be the degree of pain he's in right now. And O'Reilly is looking to reverse this by rolling over. And even though it will flip the pressure onto Dukes, it will still keep agonising pressure on the leg of O'Reilly. And that was smart because, as I was saying, Dave, he knew that was going to be the case. So he rolled all the way through and made it to the ropes. Once again, trying for the left leg is Dukes, but this time O'Reilly sends him to the ropes. Double close on both men down. This one has gone on a long time and it has been punishing. Referee once again counting. Can either man find the energy to give himself that advantage by being the first one back up? Gripping stuff here in the final first round match in Toronto. O'Reilly got to his feet, but then his leg buckled. Dukes, this time on the ankle, it's been the knee that's taken the brunt, but trying to uh, double down on that damage to the left leg now is Dukes by going to the ankle as well. 
And this reminds me of the strategy that Antonio Noki used against Muhammad Ali. He stayed on the ground and kicked his way back up. Such guts from O'Reilly to oh. keep fighting here and with his good knee. May have knocked Dukes unconscious. That was absolutely brutal. I mean, the force of that high knee in the side of the face of Tyson Dukes. I mean, he could be out, Dave. He's moving, but the lights are on. Nobody, I believe, will, will be home after that. Look at this. And it's definitely O'Reilly who's going to be back up first this time. Dukes doesn't know what side of the Atlantic he's on. He could be anywhere. Trying for the suplex, but once more that leg causing problems for O'Reilly as Dukes tries to block the suplex successfully twice. Oh, Grovit. Front face look, look at that. Twisting the neck in the same way those headlocks were Was earlier he... in the match. What's he going for there, Dave? Well, Dukes is trying to trying to grab the right leg, see if he can. Yeah, O'Reilly's got all that forearm. And what happened? Is he out? Well, I'm not sure if Dukes, Dukes may have passed out. A, a referee has not called for the bell. We had the forearm across the carotid artery of Dukes, so that was enough to send him unconscious, but interesting decision by both the referee and O'Reilly there to break that hold. Yeah, why did O'Reilly stop? Well, could have got this by, by knockout. I said the lights are on and no one's home. That's how it looked. Oh, oh. Oh, the reversal there. Well, oh, he's got him in that sleeper, Dave. Well, this, that really could do it. Again, it's not pretty, but Dukes was so close to passing out a second ago. Oh, that's smart, though. The leg this time. Counter from O'Reilly, who's try trying to break that left arm. Almost a version of the Kimura lock he's trying for there is O'Reilly. And fighting against Carlo Rowley is like trying to win a battle with a pit, a pit bull. He just keeps going for anything. Once he's locked in with those teeth, and it's not his teeth, it's his limbs, he's devastating. And look at that brain buster. That might do it. Lateral press. Left up, shoulder up, but it's the left shoulder that falls victim to the arm again. And he taps, oh. he taps, he taps. Kyle O'Reilly survives a war. Kyle Horsemen, they were in presence, and I'm not talking about the group led by Ric Flair and Ole Anderson, because Armageddon was all it took. Well, what a bruising encounter here between Kyle O'Reilly and Tyson Dukes. And I'll ask the question again, how much does Kyle O'Reilly have left in the tank when he goes on to face Mike Bailey. Well, I'll repeat the question from earlier. How much has Mike Bailey got left in the tank after what we saw from his first round match? I'll tell you what, the second round of the WCPW World Cup, Canada Lake, is going to be both impressive and incredibly interesting. Both these two to their feet. Are we going to see a handshake? I hope we will, because that was an absolutely stunning professional wrestling match. There we go. Well. Kyle O'Reilly advances at the expense of Tyson Dukes. He will go on, as we said, to face Mike Bailey. That's coming up later on in the show. The champion has an advantage, but the strong favorite on this occasion is the challenger. He is on his way to the ring. The technical wizard. 
going to get it done here against Zack Sabre Jr. I worry for the future of this young title reign. It could have been worse, he could have been flying high on Prince Amin's magic carpet because Amin obviously missed this venue and went straight over the top of it. He is not here. You actually believe that magic carpet stuff, do you? I've seen him, he, he flies on it. All right. I don't know what you'd eaten that day, but maybe don't eat it again. Gabriel Kidd, at no regrets, had one of the most emotional moments in WCPW history when he finally snapped that 0-26 losing streak to pin Cody Rhodes and become the internet champion, but that seems like a long time ago now as he stares across the ring at Zack Sabre Jr. And this is where, I hate to say it, Gabriel Kidd has a huge disadvantage, not just because of how good Zack Sabre Jr. is, but this is where jet lag will play into this. You see, Zack Sabre Jr. is used to wrestling all around the world. He is a jet-setting superstar. This guy goes to Japan, all across Europe, to America regularly. This, as far as I know, is Gabriel Kidd's first overseas match. So the stakes are high, the pressure is on, and he's probably not got enough sleep. You know, sometimes a lack of sleep can make you worse, or sometimes it puts you in that awkward state of awareness and you become better. Only time will tell. Yeah, Sabre Jr. now resides in New York City, which isn't actually that far from Toronto in the grand scheme of things. As you say, Gabriel Kidd just less than 12 hours ago landed in Canada, flying over from the UK. Yeah, Sabre Jr. has been after this internet title for some time. He had an opportunity for it at, the, at Kirby Mania, in fact, at the start of January against Cody Rhodes. Was unsuccessful on that occasion, but if I'm Sabre Jr., I'm thinking it's a weaker opponent here in Gabriel Kidd than it was in Cody. I mean, Zack Sabre Jr., you just see by the sheer force of how he applies any time. I mean, normally most people grab a hold or grab a body part. Zack Sabre Jr. wrenches the body part to grab it. It's just a totally different style. And it makes everything he do, does sorry, so effective, so brutal. I mean, Gabriel Kidd, you mentioned, has been here for 12 hours. Most of the guys, you know, went out, did a little bit of sightseeing. Gabriel Kidd went straight to bed because he knows he is in for the fight of his life right here. Sabre is pulling on the chin. He'll just, I've said this before, but the way that Sabre Jr. just reaches with all of his limbs, just grabs any stray body part and just tortures opponents. It's unlike any other professional wrestler on the planet. And the most interesting thing for me when you watch Zack Sabre Jr. wrestle is you keep a look on the face and particularly the eyes of this man. He is always thinking, even when he's in pain, you can see the wheels and the cogs turning because what he's looking for is not a moment's rest for his opponent. He wants to go straight back to another hold. I mean, this guy is an intellectual, a thinking man's professional wrestler. Unlike the, the, the likes of which, sorry, I don't think we've ever seen. He's that good. Twisting the head of Gabriel Kidd here. Is mentioned that Gabriel Kidd was 0-26. doesn't really tell the full story because he was very close to some victories against some of the best in the business, including Johnny Mundo and Zack Sabre Jr., as you say. And Kidd's got to think, after that previous match, or well, several of his previous matches, that he actually does have the talent here, he does have the ability uh, to beat Zack Sabre Jr. Sabre Jr. is so fast. 
so, so fast. And you notice when he's in a hold, he will reach out and touch as many different parts of his opponent's body as possible. It disorientates his opponent. They can't tell if he's going for the head, the arm, the leg. And that's one of the strengths of Sabre Jr. His opponents are so petrified of the thousands of moves and reversals he knows that they just don't know which way they're coming. See, I'm not sure. Correct me here, you're, you know, as, a, as a former wrestler, but if you're Gabriel Kidd here, do you really want to try and take Zack Sabre Jr. on the mat? This no. Seems, it seems to me it's a bad plan. Totally not. But you've got to remember, the last time these two fought each other, Gabriel Kidd mixed it up. And there was a point where he hit that kamikaze crash rolling Samoan, followed by a moonsault from the second rope. And literally, and this is why they call him a wizard, Zack Sabre Jr. caught him in that cross arm breaker while he was in mid-air with a moonsault. So Gabriel Kidd knows no matter what style he uses, no matter what moves he goes for, Zack Sabre Jr. can get those submissions from anywhere. Sabre has gone behind with a handlock now, grabs a headlock. Gabriel Kidd's been saying throughout his uh, losing streak before he won the internet title, do not give up on Gabriel Kidd. And these fans certainly aren't. If there is uh, one man who's on such a hot streak that he could beat Zack Sabre Jr. here, it is Kidd. If I was Gabriel Kidd, and I'm not, but if I was, the strategy I would use would be power moves, heavy hitting offense. Don't allow Zack Sabre Jr to get into this kind of catch as catch can chain wrestling but also don't allow your body to be far enough away to be a victim of those kicks i think the the, the, the downside to when people wrestle zack sabre jr is they almost feel like they want to show the rest of the world that they can go toe to toe with such a technical wizard it's a young man's mistake they get in there they want to prove that they can wrestle at his level and then they fall victim to zack sabre jr's repertoire yeah, moves look at that though kid just was able to sort of unceremoniously take his ankle out from that hole from Saber, and Saber looks absolutely furious at himself. A bit of um, humiliation there from Kid, and Saber Jr. is not going to stand for that. But how furious was Zack Saber Jr., or was he luring Gabriel Kid into a full sense of chain wrestling security? Well, that's a great question. Zack Saber Jr. just so many different ways to beat you, not just physical but mental as well. Kid again is trying to wrestle technically and he is holding his own but in the long term you just can't see him winning if this is the kind of match it's going to be. He needs to, as you say, to change things up here and get Sabre onto territory where he's less comfortable. I mean credit to Gabriel Kid. He's going move for move with Zack Sabre Jr. I mean that is an impressive feat right there. Bending the fingers backwards. Sabre, you see, see how quickly Sabre knows the way out. That's the drop toe hold and Kid has to grab the ropes. You know what else I've noticed just watching this? Is every time Gabriel Kid gets an advantage on Zack Sabre Jr. His focus shifts away from his opponent and shifts towards the crowd. Almost him acknowledging the crowd and letting them know he's in control. Zack Sabre Jr. on the other hand has his eyes firmly fixed on his opponent almost at all times. Gabriel Kidd, if he does retain the internet title here, is due for another title defence tomorrow on What Culture Extra as part of Hendry Mania. They're going to defend against Scotland's Kenny Williams. That match obviously will go ahead regardless, but if Sabre wins the internet title here, then it won't be for the championship. My gosh. Kidd is... Uh, yeah, listen, well, listen to that from Kidd. Absolutely cannot believe the pain that Sabre Jr. has been able to inflict on him. That's twisted in the neck, Dave. If that happened to a normal person, I would feel confident to say that at least a few of those people would have a broken neck as a result of that. I mean, it's the neck strength that pro wrestlers develop over time with constant bridging that prevents that from happening. But a few of those, even to a pro wrestler, oh God, look at that. Double whammy. Kid was trying to get to the ropes with his and he finally does with the other hand, but not before Sabre Jr. has bent those fingers backwards. I physically winced there looking at that. Goodness me, Sabre Jr. Again, and this is where we're starting to see, we talked about credit to Kid for going hole for hole with Sabre Jr., but that cannot go on forever. And the longer this goes, the more you're seeing that Sabre takes advantage while we're in this kind of technical sort of contest. 
kick in the shoulders. Listen to that. Ted screaming in pain. Saber hooks the leg into a, an STF. And now bending the arm backwards. There he is again, just grabbing that stray limb. And do you know why? Gabriel Kidd there could have reached the ropes to his side, but he didn't want to get his arms closer to Zack Sabre Jr. because they were then prone to be stretched or broken. So Gabriel Kidd stretched his arms away from Zack Sabre Jr., which actually was the furthest length for those ropes. I mean, in a way it was smart, and in another way it, it made the pain go on for longer. Well, there weren't a lot of good options there for Gabriel Kidd. This kid is uh, just almost looking at looking uh, disheartened here but he's trying to fight back but look at determination now from Kidd and now oh, Sabre Sabre got him caught oh. Sabre bending those arms backwards oh, God. look at Kidd trying to wriggle around onto his front and finally gets to the ropes Sabre is frustrated sort of throwing those arms away of Kidd like almost in a tantrum I think this isn't quite the uh, easy day at the office that Sabre Jr. was maybe hoping for. He was thinking it was almost a foregone conclusion that he was going to leave with the internet title. He could only stay in this for five seconds and a bit of respect for the rules there by Sabre Jr. because he broke out after two. But Sabre Jr. is almost using Gabriel Kidd as a crash test dummy for every type of pain infliction device known in pro wrestling. Oh! Kidd fought back with a, an uppercut there. Reverse suplex in the end, Sabre ends up on his front. And that's the offense that Gabriel Kidd is going to need to go for, as I said earlier. High impact, all force. Just uh, only just into his 20s is Gabriel Kidd, turned 20 the week before he won the internet title. Which is incredible when you think about it. Oh, absolutely remarkable. And Kidd, as you said, very well put together, great strength, possibly has the strength advantage over Sabre. To the corner. This is better from Gabriel Kidd. Exactly what we were saying. He needs to try for this kind of offense against Zack Sabre Jr. There's a missile drop kick. Sends Sabre halfway across the ring and he might retain here. He might, but he doesn't. Better from Gabriel Kidd. And I hate to keep pointing out mistakes Gabriel Kidd's making here, but I think going for that pinfall was a mistake because you know Zack Sabre Jr. is as resilient as they come. What he wants to do is capitalise on that momentum he had going and just keep inflicting those powerful, impactful moves for as long as he possibly can. And it looked like he was going to go for it with that kamikaze crash attack. Sabre around the back. Paul Nelson once but twice. Elbow releases that hold. Sabre going to fall with the ball. Oh my God! Fireman's carries were definitely driver from Gabriel Kidd and it was worth two and a half. Gabriel Kidd is starting to believe that he can retain here. Can he, can he fly back to the UK with that championship belt still in his luggage? But this is where cardiovascular conditioning will play such a vital factor because I don't think there's anyone I know in pro wrestling that has better conditioning than Zack Sabre Jr. Oh. As the match goes longer, he gets stronger, and we're seeing it right here. Oh. Tornado DDT! Oh. And he holds on to the to that head. Now grabs the right arm, twists it backwards. Kid's gonna have to tap! Kid's gonna have to tap! New internet champion, surely here! Surely! Look at the eyes popping out of the head of Gabriel Kidd, the champion! Sabre trying to stop him from wriggling, but somehow stretching his leg as far as it would go. Gabriel Kidd just made the bottom rope. It was a matter of centimetres, millimetres. Keeping further into the middle of the ring, we would have a new internet champion right now. What a match between Gabriel Kidd and Zack Sabre Jr. here in Toronto for the WCPW Internet Championship. Sabre. That look on his face, like he can't quite believe the resilience of this kid. The kid is giving as good as he gets on these strikes. And Sabre cranking up the intensity again. Kid still as good as he's getting. 
kid. Again comes back with the uppercut. But this is turning absolutely brutal between Saber and Kid. Look at this. Look at the speed of these, though. Incredible. Oh, backslide. Oh, Kid's got him. Kid's got him. He only got one. Saber trying to grab the leg. Kid rolls through, but Saber counters. The shoulders are down. Kid counters instead. Both men try for pin after pin. It's Saber Juniors. Shoulders go down in the end, and we are back to our feet. A little slap from an increasingly annoyed Zack Saber Jr. And this crowd in Toronto getting an incredible dose of what British wrestling is all about in 2017. Ah, oh, double headbutt there. Scoop power slam, a body slam by Gabriel Kidd. Oh, second row moves on Dave. Here it comes. Oh, oh. Got him. This is what he did before. Into the triangle lock. The triangle lock from Saber. Elbows into the skull of Gabriel Kidd. He's going to have to tap. He's going to have to tap. Saber Jr. seconds away from the internet title. Kidd. Can Kidd possibly survive this? Well, what is he? Kidd's on his feet. Oh my God. Oh, look at the strength of the champion, though. Down with a power bomb. And Gabriel Kidd is still in this one. How impressive was that? What power? While under extreme pain from Gabriel Kidd. We said that when Kidd won the internet title, maybe his moment had come. Maybe he had finally arrived in the pro wrestling world as a real player. And that might be what we're seeing unfold here in Toronto. Sabre Jr. has been taken to his limit. Look at him. Exhausted. Were you expecting to see this? Well, I said about cardiovascular conditioning, but there is one elephant in the room, and that is the damage that has been done to Zack Sabre Jr.'s body. Maybe that's playing a toll, but clearly not. As I say it, the opposite happens. Look at this. I'm using his foot to kick into the head of Gabriel Kidd. God, this guy is incredible. Every single part of Zack Sabre Jr.'s body is a weapon. Oh, oh, he's got him in that kamikaze crash, rolling Samoan drop up onto the second. Could this be all day? But he hits it. Moves out by Kidd. The cover. He gets two and all. Oh, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. And if you're Gabriel Kidd, what more can you throw at the technical wizard? The champion in a state of shock and awe. But he needs to regroup, recover and fight back quick because he has the biggest challenge he could possibly have here in Toronto. Zack Sabre Jr. and the challenger is still in. Sabre Jr. Checking these various body parts that have been assaulted here by Gabriel Kidd. He's still in one piece, but barely as Kidd continues this offense. Sabre, German oh. suplex. Look at the impact of that German suplex. No bridge, all impact, and he does it again. Second time, oh, oh God. God, a kick across the chest. Kick it down one. There's a statement. Here comes the PK and a penalty kick from Sabre Jr. to win the internet title. And again, again, Gabriel Kidd kicks out. Oh, and Gabriel Kidd. Zack Sabre Jr. just... Oh, 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 oh he's got him. Oh. Caught him. Small package. Oh, Small package. Oh, God. And Kidd. Kidd beats Sabre Jr. Well, that's exactly what happened in this internet championship match because as Zack Sabre Jr. went for his third and as he probably fought final penalty kick, it turns out the champion played dead, went for that small package, got it, and that was the end. The champ retains. Gabriel Kidd came to Canada as the underdog against arguably the best pro wrestler in the world today. And somehow, the internet champion has left victorious. What a story here in Toronto. And Sabre is livid that he got caught in that small package. And it's amazing following the growth of Gabriel Kidd like we have. Particularly from that first match with Sabre Jr. to this one right here. What a story and what a contest. And we're not done. And neither by the looks of it is Gabriel Kidd. Well, Kidd is 
gesturing to Sabre Jr. to come back into the ring. And what I hope is going to be a gesture of respect and nothing else. Well, hang on, oh, Sabre Jr. is still on the border here and boiling over with rage at that defeat. Oh, Sabre, look at him. Look how angry he is. Sabre's got the internet title, but he didn't win it. It's the second time he's tried to. Second time he's been unsuccessful. That's one and one. I don't know when. I don't know where. But someone's gotta. Someone's gotta win this thing. Me and you, one more time. What'd you say? Sabre Junior. From it, oh, being offered, I should say, a rubber match, so to speak, with Gabriel Kidd after they are one win apiece against each other. A huge upset here for Gabriel Kidd as he retains the internet title. Well, coming up next, the second round matches in the Pro Wrestling World Cup. But these fans in Toronto believe, and they did not give up on Gabriel Kidd. Your What Culture Pro Wrestling general manager, you may have seen in the video we released about Loaded being cancelled that we are keeping uh, some of those dates that were previously announced. One of those dates is June the 2nd, which we're turning into a show called Fight Back. That's a nice logo, isn't it? I like that logo. What do you think of that logo, YouTube? Do you like that logo? Now, YouTube's change to its monetization means that we can no longer do a weekly free show. We just can't afford it, and that's, that's awful. However, we are keeping the June 2nd show fight back completely free. It's going to air 24 hours after it takes place. It's going to be uploaded for free in its entirety to the YouTube channel on Saturday, June the 3rd. Of course, if you want to see that show live, you're going to have to buy tickets at wc.pw. And I can now announce two matches that will be taking place on June the 2nd. They're going to be two number one contendership matches taking place, one for the tag titles and one for the WCPW Championship. The tag titles are going to take the form of a five-team gauntlet match. I can announce three of the teams now. Prospect, Kid Fight and Luke King Sharp, and for the first time since Moss returned from injury, the team, the ex-champions of Moss and Slater. There are two more teams yet to be announced. We are finalizing the signings now, and I can tell you, you're probably going to be excited about them. Second of all, there's going to be a number one contendership fatal four-way for the WCPW Championship pitting Rampage versus Dave Mastiff versus El Ligero versus Joe Coffey. Once again, it will be aired in its entirety for free on Saturday the 3rd of June, but if you want to be there live on Friday the 2nd, tickets are available at wc.pw. Stay tuned for more matches soon to be announced. Time for the second round matches in the Canadian qualifiers for the Pro Wrestling World Cup. This could be a great one. Michael Elgin and Harry Smith. Well, I mean, we saw earlier Michael Elgin in his first round match against a much taller, longer limbed opponent. And it's almost like a replay of that. Two men in Dupree and Harry Smith that grew up in this business. Elgin really has, I, I don't know if that's the luck of the draw because he won, or the unluck or unluckiness of the draw because Harry Smith, in my opinion, is as tough as they come. Ladies and gentlemen, the following contest is a semi-final match in the WCPW World Cup Canadian Qualifiers. And it's scheduled for one fall. Introducing first, from Calgary, Alberta, weighing in at 250 pounds, Harry Smith! Harry Smith beat FTM, Frankie the Mobster, in, uh, in the first round, but he's had less time to rest than has Elgin, and this is going to be a real challenge for the son of the British Bulldog. And his opponent, from Oshawa, Ontario, weighing in at 255 pounds, Big Mike, Michael L. Well, what an opportunity here 
here for Michael Elgin, having knocked off Rene Dupree in the first round. If he can beat another former WWE star in the second round, what a way that would be to qualify as one of the two representatives for your country in the Pro Wrestling World Cup Finals. Elgin with a lot of support here in Toronto, where he is a hometown boy. And interestingly, we saw in that first round contest, Harry Smith bending, well actually I'm not gonna say bending, breaking the rules, and that theme continues here in his second round match against Elgin. And that is probably why this crowd is more pro Elgin at this point. One thing that you'd have to say about Harry Smith is that his, his most recent run in New Japan has really helped him develop a ruthless streak, which can sometimes cross the line into rule breaking. But meanwhile, this has crossed the line into the crowd in the opening seconds between Elgin and Smith. Oh, hang on, there's danger of leaving the, the building here. Well, Elgin won his first match by disqualification. He may lose his second by a count out. Yeah, Elgin was somewhat fortunate in that Rene Dupree made a a huge error in bringing in a steel chair. It really lost his temper. Oh, it's drinking the face. Smith with those knees into the midsection, into the ribs of Elgin. This one has uh, got out of control very quickly. Referee needs to somehow try and lay down the law here. And they are over by the bar area. My favourite spot in this venue. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, place yes, you're most familiar with. I've been there all yes, afternoon. Yes, 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 Elgin yes, yes, grabbing yes, Smith, who was trying to escape. I think, oh my goodness me, Smith sent crashing into the into the floor. There's a chair involved, and Smith can hit Elgin with that chair across the back. And I think Smith now is trying to bring Elgin back to the ring, having hit him with that chair. I think he thinks that this is a good time to try and steal the victory early on. But now Elgin's got a chair. Well, I know referee Jimmy Corderes got a, a little bit of, um, what's the word I want to say? Politically correctly, I'll say a little bit of a telling off from that DQ earlier because you know, management in the back said nobody wants to see countouts, the disqualifications, although I don't really think he had much choice when a chair was brought into play. And I think that's the reason he's letting this one go a little bit further in our second round. Well, to be fair, it has been that six of one and half a dozen of the other between these two since they've got outside. And that's the same number. I know, that's... Six, six of one, half a dozen, six. I know, and the point of the saying. Unless it's a baker's dozen, which is 13. So that's six and a half. But it's not. I didn't say it was... A, never mind. I don't know why I ever try and use any kind of analogy when I'm sitting next to you. Just completely over your head. Smith, the left leg of Elgin. Ah, oh, dragon screw leg whip of sorts. But with the guy standing, standing up. Oh, that really twisted the, uh, the ligaments there of Elgin. Smith capitalising, sending that leg the knee into the uh, ring post and it's the second time that exact ring post has come into play in such a way because let's not forget this is how it all started with Carl O'Reilly earlier and we saw what happened to that leg as the match continues and that is an ongoing question here as we enter into this second oh, round hang oh, on shades of his uncle Brett the Hitman Hart we know where he learned this and Smith just twisting on the legs obviously that move is illegal he's got five seconds to break it but there's a lot of damage you can do in five seconds. Yeah, five seconds in that is like 20 seconds or more in a normal figure four leg lock. And 20 seconds in a figure four is a long time. Smith really trying to take advantage here, twisting the ankle and then smashing the leg into the canvas. Yeah, and the response for Smith has become decidedly more mixed, you know, since he uh, took that shortcut, that low blow to beat FTM in the first round. Part of that is perhaps that Elgin is a hometown boy and, and uh, Smith is from Western Canada, but part of it, I think, is a reaction to how Smith behaved earlier. Oh, what a 
agree with you for the first time ever in our commentary careers. Really? Yeah. Make the most of it. It must be the jet lag kicking in. All that time you spent at the bar. Oh, it, that, in between that and trying to wake up Gabriel Kidd and tell him why he's not out with the rest of us. That was, and now we know why. Yeah, that was responsible of you. Right, he won. So he was right. Oh, so you were wrong. Well, I would say I was wrong. Oh, no, of course so, not. Just had a difference in philosophies. He's won, won him a match and my one got me hammered. Well, Smith is hammering on that Elgin on all these different body parts right nice. now. Nice, nice. See what you did there. Good segue, wasn't it? Thank you. You agreed with me and complimented me in the course of one minute. It's a career highlight. Smith trying to do more damage to that left ankle. And uh, Elgin is in some real difficulty here. This is actually, as you say, very reminiscent of the situation that Kyle O'Reilly found himself in. And I was going to say a minute ago, that is still one of the big open questions in this second round. What condition will Kyle O'Reilly's left knee be in when he faces Mike Bailey in our very next match? And let's not forget that Harry Smith's great uncle was the legendary Stu Hart, who, to be honest, when it came to inflicting pain on people, was a very sadistic man. But the apple does not fall far from the tree. In a league of his own, but Harry Smith spent a lot of time in Stu Hart's dungeon as a child and as a young man learning a lot of those holds. Also had a lot of time trained by Bruce Hart, his uncle. He's trying to twist on that ankle and put that knee in a, in a position it does not want to be in. And he's got an uncle called Smith Hart, which considering he's second name Smith, would be quite confusing as a child. Well, only if your intelligence is quite low, like you. But Perhaps if Harry has a kid, he can call it Hart Smith. Can you stop now? Thank you. Now, hang on. Elkin is trying to grab it. Waving over a sharpshooter there. That would have been quite an insult to someone uh, from the Hart Smith family. Smith with a smile on his face. Oh. And he seems to be thriving on this uh, slight antagonism from the crowd. It's not only the peroxide he shares with Ric Flair, it's a strut. What's he trying to do here? Maybe. Well, he's just done a strut, Dave, so yeah. what do you think? Well, do the math on that, Scott Steiner. <laughs> well, I see you're back to your normal condescending self. Anyway, here's a figure four leg lock from Smith. As Elgin's shoulders are down, he needs to be careful he doesn't lose this by pinfall. Referee Jimmy Corderas is asking how we look at oh, Smith. Smith is using the ropes to his advantage. He is channeling the dirtiest player in the game. Again, Smith using his using the rope that increases the torque on the legs of Elgin. Did he? I think Corderas may have seen it that time. Did he? No. You can only. Uh, demand the break if you're the referee if you see the cheating happen just seeing the rope vibrating afterwards is not enough Corderas knows that oh this time he gets him and finally Smith with no choice but to break the hold if he was disqualified here then Elgin would go on to the finals remember there will be two men representing Canada in the last 16 of the Pro Wrestling World Cup at the end of August, it'll be the winner of this match and the winner of Bailey versus O'Reilly in just a few minutes. Oh, now he's channeling Rick Rude. Oh, look at that bridge. The uh, knee of, of Elgin and all kinds of twisting and turning positions it doesn't want to be in. This has been a laser-like focus on one body part from Harry Smith. Elgin backed into the corner and again it's Smith twisting the uh, the knee around the middle rope another one of those holds that's illegal because it uses the ropes to help but five seconds is a long time to do some damage Elgin finally moved out of the way of one Smith hit his knee hard into the turnbuckle there's a twisting forearm nearly knocked Smith senseless probably the most high-impact offense we've seen in this match from Elgin. 
That was like full force. This has been, yeah, 80% of this match has been Smith on. Oh, oh. there's an enziguri from Elgin. Elgin trying for the German suplex and gets it right on the back of his head. Harry Smith was almost in a state of shock and awe as he went over, didn't manage to protect his head and landed on it as hard as he could. Look, he's dazed and confused. Here comes Elgin, trying to lock some uh, circulation back into his left leg. He closed on Smith in the corner. And Smith on oh, uh, Drop kick to the knee. Smith knew exactly what he was doing there. Gonna try for the super, gets killed. Oh, Falcon Arrow! Elgin, cover on Smith. I know it was nearly enough. Left shoulder up. Smith has found the tables have turned exceedingly quickly here in this second round match. And give credit where it's due, because even on one leg, he still had the strength to hoist up a man as big as Harry Smith. That was impressive. Look at this now, Elgin, trying to fight through the pain. That's definitely there on that left leg, but that's going to be very hard to hit the pile driver like that. Yeah, the sharpshooter attempt from Smith. Elgin knew what was coming, goes straight to the ropes. And it was really limiting the offensive options available to Elgin, the fact that he doesn't have a lot of oh, strength in that left leg, but another German suplex. So, he hit him with so much force, it dislodged his jockstrap. I mean, that's impressive. Elgin has Smith lined up. Larry, I think Smith blocked. Cover. Will that do it? No, not quite. Smith. Still very much on top here after a slight comeback. Over to Sharpshooter again. This time he gets it. Sharpshooter drags Elgin into the middle of the ring. And Elgin is going to have to. Surely he's going to have to tap if he can't reach that bottom rope. Smith hasn't got it quite cinched down as hard as he could. That's allowing Elgin to get a little bit of movement. He's close to the ropes now, but is he close enough? See, the difference between Smith and Bret Hart was height. And you see Harry Smith now, now he's cinching back. The problem is, because of the sheer height of Harry Smith, if he cinches back too far, he runs the risk of losing balance and falling backwards. And that may have been the only thing that saved Elgin from managing to get to the ropes there. Smith and Elgin now find themselves on the ring apron. This is a dangerous place to be, particularly if Smith does what he's planning here. We have pile driver on the hardest part of the ring, the corner of the ring apron. Well, don't do that. Smith is uh, being blocked here. Elgin using the ropes to hold himself down. This is not a safe place to be for either the wrestlers or the fans in the front row, frankly. Big boot into the face from Elgin. A super kick into the jaw. Smith dropping to the floor. And this is what Elgin has been waiting for the entire contest. To see Harry Smith in a vulnerable position. And he's got his wish, look at this. Oh, what are we going to see here? Elgin taking a run off and a cannonball dive onto Harry Smith. Been a hard hitting heavyweight contest here in the second round of the Canadian qualifiers. Only one of these two men, Michael Elgin or Harry Smith, can advance to represent their country in England in August in the finals. Will it be Elgin? It will be if he gets the win here. The leg is hurt and he gets two and three quarters. Elgin. Feels like the end may be near for Harry Smith who is struggling to get himself back onto two feet. Went for a close line, did Elgin no one there? They both hit each other, neither man goes down. These two man mountains. It's a low blow! That's, that's the second time we've seen that. Oh, ref didn't see it though. And don't tell me for the 
second match in a row. Oh, no way. That Smith is going to win with the pile driver. Oh, he got it, Dave. He, he got, got it. it. That's got to be all. Surely not. Oh, Elgin got out. Elgin got out. Good. Can't do that. You cannot take a shortcut to representing your country in a tournament as prestigious as the Pro Wrestling World Cup. Harry Smith cannot believe it, and neither can I. I mean, Elgin landed on his head full force, but he's still in this one, but for how long? Sharpshooter really could end it. He's already been in this hole once, remember. Elgin was able to make the ropes that first time. Oh, Elgin counters. Elgin's got the legs tied up, and he nearly, nearly surprised Harry Smith. Oh. No one home there, Smith ends up perched on the top turnbuckle. He landed on that top rope with sheer force. That family tree could end up looking like a stump going forwards if he's not careful. Well, hang on, hang on a minute. Elgin, maybe he can go for that Elgin bomb. And he gets it, the Elgin bomb, the cover, and Smith, and it's enough, it's enough. Michael Elgin will represent Canada. Mike, Michael Elgin. Michael Elgin will be one of the two men who represents the Great White North in the finals of the Pro Wrestling World Cup this August after a titanic struggle against Harry Smith. Unbelievable contest and an unbelievable victory by Elgin. Man, that was a shocker, but he deserves that spot in the finals in England because that was outstanding. Well, Smith nearly stole a victory here in the second round like he did in the first round against FTM. Elgin somehow kicked out of that pile driver and went on to win. Now he holds up that Canadian flag high as he will be going to the finals. But who will be joining him? Will it be Kyle O'Reilly or Mike Bailey? That's what we're going to find out next as these Canadian qualifiers reach their climax here in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Hello, I'm your What Culture Pro Wrestling General Manager. WCPW has been around for a year. That is mental. Um, first of all, it's an honor to be the general manager at this point in time. Uh, WCPW, uh, we hope, has gone from strength to strength over the last 12 months. Uh, and we've decided to, to celebrate our one year birthday, uh, our anniversary. Uh, we're going to do a special Built to Destroy anniversary show on the 16th of June at one of our favorite venues, and a venue that was instrumental to us growing in our very early months, the O2 Academy in Newcastle. That's taking place on Friday, the 16th of June, one year and one day after our very first WCPW tapings. It's going to be a fantastic night. Not only will we have wrestlers who are wrestling on the very first WCPW show in attendance, we'll also have brand new stars as well. In terms of matches, there are some still to be finalized, but I can confirm that WCPW Tag Team Champions, the Swords of Essex, Will Ospreay and Scott Wainwright will be defending their belts against the winners of the Tag Team Gauntlet number one contenders match at Fight Back on June the 2nd. Also, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to say that a wrestler who was so important to bringing publicity and eyes to our first WCPW PW tapings will be wrestling on that show. That man is the former Ring of Honor world champion, Jay Lethal. There are many more matches for our anniversary show, Built to Destroy, to be announced. Check back on the YouTube channel for those. In the meantime, O2 Priority tickets are already on sale for this event, and the rest go on sale this Friday. Grab yours, it will sell out. I have been your What Culture Pro Wrestling General Manager. We did it! A year! We're still going! And I'll see you soon. Michael Elgin then into the finals of the Pro Wrestling World Cup for Canada, but who will join him? Kyle O'Reilly or Mike Bailey? Well, if any two men in the first round took more damage and still went through to the second round, then Kyle O'Reilly and Mike Bailey, oh, well, I don't know who it is because there isn't anybody, Dave. This is, uh, is going to be very interesting. I'll, I'll be surprised if Mike Bailey can still come out here in one piece. That was an incredible showing. Well, Kyle O'Reilly, I'll be surprised if he can come out on two feet because that left leg was uh, absolutely decimated by Tyson Duke.
Introducing first, from Montreal, Quebec, weighing in at 185 pounds, Speedball Mike Bailey! Mike Bailey beat Brent Banks in the uh, first round in a high-flying thriller. But as you said, Alex, he took a tremendous amount of punishment on the way to doing so. He has had just a little bit longer to rest than his opponent here, and that could be a deciding factor because what's going to matter here more than anything is who has the most fuel left in the tank out of these two tremendous competitors. Well, I said earlier, Brett Banks and Mike Bailey was going to be outstanding. I'll tell you something right now. If Carl O'Reilly comes to this ring, which I believe he will, this may just be the second match of the night. Making them the matches of the night. That would make more I, sense. I understood, yeah. And his opponent, from Vancouver, British Columbia, weighing at 210 pounds, the violent artist, Kyle O'Reilly! O'Reilly still limping on that left leg after the uh, match against Tyson Dukes and normally I would say that O'Reilly was the favourite here because he's the more decorated of the two wrestlers we mentioned earlier former Ring of Honor world champion among other things but you've got to wonder here whether in these circumstances whether Mike Bailey might be able to get a victory over O'Reilly that he otherwise would not be able to get. It's a very good point because you know if, if all the body parts to have damage the one you don't want is your leg it's hard to mask it. I mean, you saw that on the way down to the ring. An injury anywhere else, I guess from, apart from maybe the ankle, you just, you don't telegraph it to everybody. Everybody in this building knows the pain that Carl O'Reilly is in. Most of all, unfortunately for O'Reilly, is his opponent, Mike Bailey. I mean, he's gonna smell blood like a shark. And Bailey, I'm sure he is masking some, uh, some pain after that first round, but he looks, just on the face of it to be in much better condition than O'Reilly. So let's see what happens here. Fist bump of honor. One of these two men gonna join Michael Elgin as the Canadian representatives in the finals of the Pro Wrestling World Cup in England this August. Roundhouse kick attempt there from Bailey. And O'Reilly needs to just uh, play Matador here a little bit, not get suckered into anything too early. Riley, what can you do here, Alex, to protect that left leg? I was just thinking if Matador was Spanish for doormat. Um, I mean, I don't really... I'm not sure at this point. It's not just protecting the leg, it's protecting against the overall speed of Mike Bailey. I mean, this guy, she just moves so fast, it's like you need eyes all over your head to be able to keep an eye on him. He's got that martial arts background that's helped him so much in his career so far, Bailey. Look. Feet of Fury. You'd have to be a fly to be able to stay up to speed with where his kicks were going. O'Reilly is, is holding his own here to a point, but it's just a matter of time, you've got to think, till, uh, ah. till Bailey lands one on the left leg. And that was interesting there, because Carl O'Reilly has a very interesting stance. His head is always down, protecting his chin and neck. And right there, Mike Bailey had it well scouted, grabbed him in that front face lock. The other pressure is uh, that there's going to be on Carl O'Reilly is because he leans forward with his stance, he's quite heavy with his, you know what I'm saying? He, he hunches over quite a bit with that fighter's stance. That puts even more pressure on the knees. It takes the pressure of the stance off the hips and onto the knees. And of course, not used to leading with his left leg in that stance, and that means that's that, uh, got a big target on it. It's put front and center for Bailey. And he hit one there, and O'Reilly instantly, after what wasn't too much of a hard shot, had to immediately retreat to the outside, which tells you just how bad the condition of that leg is. Well, you say it wasn't too much of a hard shot, but there's no way of really telling. If he hit it, you know, face on on the knee pad, that's somewhat protected. But if he hit it on the side, which it looked like he did, I mean, that's just gonna send shock waves all through the leg and up the body. But don't get me wrong, I wouldn't want to be kicked in the leg by Mike Bailey, even if I was, my leg was in perfect condition. But... That was unfortunate, because I was just gonna volunteer to kick you in the head. See how it felt. I mean, I, I, it feel great for me. Please don't do that. Cover attempt by O'Reilly. And uh, he's got Bailey down on his back. 
O'Reilly is going to try. He's trying to leap over the legs to get into a pinning position, I think. Yeah, and interestingly, Mike Bailey is like trying to keep Kyle O'Reilly at bay. They're really trying to prevent him from getting close to him, like we saw in that first round contest. Well, O'Reilly eventually found a way round, but Bailey has uh, gone back behind him into a rear waist lock. And uh, if this is on the mat, you know, then that takes away the disadvantage that O'Reilly had. That's a very good point. Oh my God, you keep making them. This is, this is strange. Have you been on, on my Red Bulls again? I had a whole case of them, they've all vanished. Well, Bailey is uh, back to his feet. Of course, I haven't stolen you. I'm not a thief. They've gone somewhere. It's a case for Sherlock Holmes. I don't think it was Red Bulls that you were drinking at the bar earlier, so I know it wasn't you who drank them. Well, there was Red Bull in it, just balanced with vodka. In any case, we are back up to our feet now, and it's uh, O'Reilly and Bailey once more just testing each other out here. And look at this. Smart there by Carl O'Reilly, trying to defend against those kicks. But unfortunately, he has to defend against them with his kneecap. And that's the part that's injured. Goes for the uh, bottom rope, and O'Reilly will have to make the break. Bailey is complaining to the referee about something here. I'm not sure what it is, but O'Reilly is having to sit down again just to take the pressure off his leg from standing up. O'Reilly here just hoping, I think, that adrenaline's going to carry him through this one, but I guarantee you he won't be able to walk on that left leg tomorrow. I guarantee you the more that he keeps breaking the momentum, the, the less chance there is of having an adrenaline rush. It does the opposite. You're saying O'Reilly needs to keep the, keep the pace fast. And now he is. Now he is. He picks him up, slams him down. Into that oh. MMA position, the ground, ground and, and pound. pound. Exactly. Well, open hands, Dave. Was nowhere near as effective as when you do it in MMA. Again, O'Reilly to the ropes. This time, Bailey having a little rest in the opposite corner. Crowd completely absorbed by this, and it's a very different contest if you think about it to so the one we just saw. They spent the first couple of minutes of. Uh, well, it's got different people in it. I know that, but it's also you know Smith and Elgin spent the first few minutes brawling in the crowd. This has been a. Uh, a technical battle here. And the headlock from Bailey. And I don't think if I'd have been offered the bet or the odds of it being Bailey who put the first headlock on in this match, you know, I would have, I would have taken those. Thought I'd be flying back in a private jet. I'd have been wrong. I thought you were going to fly back in your helicopter. Anyway. Bailey still cinching down on that headlock. I think that's a mistake. So it's giving O'Reilly a chance to regroup, which is exactly what he's doing with those elbows to the back. Sends uh, Bailey to the ropes as O'Reilly. Oh. Leapfrog, roll through from Bailey, who's right there and hits the left leg. Big, big target on that leg once again as backflip lands on his feet. Does Bailey great agility? Oh, dragon look screw. At, look at that. And this is what Bailey wants to do. Keep the offense thick and fast. I mean, this just could be Bailey's night. Not only has he just already stolen the show, in my opinion, in his first round contest, but this could be the night he makes global headlines by beating Carl O'Reilly. Because the history books won't show that O'Reilly was injured. They will just show who scored the win. As much as it's uh, unfortunate to see O'Reilly with an injury here, it's also worth saying that Bailey would fully deserve that spot after that incredible first round match against Brent Banks. Well, it's been a night of upsets so far, particularly what we saw earlier with Gabriel Kidd and Zack Sabre Jr. I mean, that's got to be considered an upset, even though Kidd is the champion. Yeah, I'm still, still picking my jaw up off the floor from that one, but... No, you've just got a big mouth. Thank you. Was, uh, back to, again, back to your normal ways after a compliment. You can't do two compliments in a row, can you? Not with you. I could do it with my Shana Holics, but not with you. With who? My, that's what I call my fans. <laughs> Have you ever had any fans? I've got plenty of fans. Electric fans. That's hot in my house. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I saw where that one was going. Anyway, O'Reilly again. 
just uh, really weak on that left knee as he's holding it. Bailey is sizing it up, just staring at that part of the body. O'Reilly trying to fight back with forearms. Oh, look at that speed of those kicks. My gosh, wow. relentless, unstoppable. Incredible stuff from Mike Bailey. Gosh. He won't stop, literally. Unstoppable and will not stop. Completely relentless from Mike Bailey until he finally grabs and slaps to O'Reilly. We've caught him here. Oh. There you go. Overhead, belly to belly with the leg hooks. Yeah, and that, look at how uh, Bailey landed. He's holding the back of his head. Landed hard on that, on the back of the skull there. And O'Reilly thought he had him rattled enough to steal a free count. He got two. And strangely, O'Reilly may have allowed Mike Bailey to burn himself out with those kicks. I mean, doing repeated kicks like that is actually often used as a cardio exercise because that's how much energy it takes. And it's almost like O'Reilly used Roper though and let Bailey just burn himself out so he could start inflicting the offense. And this might be an example of where the uh, previous damage done to Bailey comes into effect because he must still be pretty exhausted from that match with Banks. As much as uh, O'Reilly's left leg is in trouble, do not think that Bailey is coming into this 100%. That would be a mistake. Well, I, in wrestling, I find exhaustion, much like jogging, the first place you feel it, other than the lungs, is the legs. You know, like the legs, once they have been exhausted, they feel very weak. So to hit that many repeated kicks, I think is a, in some ways is a bad strategy. You don't want to do 100 kicks that are semi-effective. You want to do two or three that are he majorly effective. Definitely the case that Bailey has really had to slow down here since those kicks as O'Reilly lands one between the shoulder blades and another one. See the difference there. Now O'Reilly picking up Bailey. And he's gonna maybe try for a shin breaker. Gets it. And what's he trying? Maybe a submission hold here from O'Reilly. Oh, wow. Wow. Double stereo wows from the commentators there. That must have been painful. And we've just seen Zack Sabre Jr. He's the king of that kind of offense. Okay, I hope I don't see Zack Sabre Jr. for a couple of hours because he is probably still living. You don't want to be near him at the moment after how frustrated he is at losing that title match earlier. Shinbreaker straight into a belly to back. And then, oh, look at that. Held onto that leg. And he's trying to level the playing field here by doing the same kind of damage to Bailey's leg that's been inflicted on his own. Bailey is in some trouble. He's a long way from the ropes. There's uh, repeated kicks from Bailey to finally free himself. I was going to say he tried to kick his lights out, but the lights came on. Do you think that was connected? Or just a no? I don't think that was connected. What is wrong with you? Bailey is uh, struggling again to get some uh, feeling back into that left leg. O'Reilly seems to be finding a second wind in, in his case. A clubbing blow across the left shoulder. It's why what, like what you said earlier, Alex, as well. He doesn't really take his arms off his opponent. Always having some part of the body connected if he can is O'Reilly. Look, still again there. Oh. Finally ends it with that arm first, smash into the canvas. And back to what you said there a second ago, the advantage of staying so fixed to his opponent was every time he went under with that wrist lock, the arm got more and more taut until it was only just a couple of fast steps that it was required to drive the shoulder of Bailey into that canvas at full force. There has been a distinct change in the weather of this match since those it's, those it's inside how can you tell that it's a metaphor since uh, Bailey apparently wore himself out and O'Reilly now look at this almost getting cocky here I met a four once what I went to Marvel live and you met a four yeah four was there oh. spider-man was there On a different level tonight. Not a good one. Oh, there we oh, go. Oh, Arm again. 
Armageddon. Armageddon, he calls it. I know that. Get it right. I was just saying what it was. Goes for the cover. Does uh, Bailey to try and break the hold. The only way that you can get it. Oh, oh. Moonsault into the double knee drop. Wow. So Bailey win his first round match with that shooting star knee drop on Banks. And uh, that has slowed down O'Reilly's momentum as well. So now both of these guys with a chance to regroup here. Referee is not starting a count. Going to allow these two to take the time they need to get back to their feet. A lot at stake here. The chance to represent your country in the first Pro Wrestling World Cup this August in England. Yes. Bailey to the corner, but O'Reilly follows him in. And O'Reilly now working through the pain. You can still see it there. But he's doing the best he can to absorb it. Ducks the kick, ducks a second, and is hit by a third. Wow. Cover. O'Reilly may be out. Bailey to go to the finals, and he's a, a half a second away. That roundhouse kick, one of the most devastating moves in Bailey's arsenal. Have I mentioned he's a ninja? He's not a ninja. He does taekwondo. Yeah, but still. I mean, yeah, but still. He moves like a ninja. All right, he's a ninja. Happy? Well, maybe going for that roundhouse kick, what we talked about. And he, oh, he was, but it got caught and counted oh. into an STF by O'Reilly. Bailey fought to stop those arms and that chin being hooked, but look at this now. Brutal, oh, brutal, oh, wow. O'Reilly follows him in with that high knee. Is an arm break? Oh, no, not, no, oh. it's not, it's counted, counted into a sleeper hole. And oh. they're in the middle of the ring. This is so fast, it's becoming impossible to call, but that wasn't. Full fall to all impact, belly to back suplex, takes Bailey out. Look how quickly O'Reilly did that before he lost enough power to do it. Only allowed himself to be in that sleeper hold for a half second. He went for the pin there and he nearly got it. Such was the impact of that side suplex. You know, sometimes in wrestling, people say, oh, a match between these two people won't be as good, but as interesting because it's a clash of styles. But in this case, the difference in styles is creating what I would call a beautiful disaster. I wasn't expecting it in some ways, but in other ways I thought it could happen. You know, look at Guerrero and Malenko, who I mentioned earlier, very different styles, incredible opponents. And these two, wow, when they get going, they are something else. Yeah, compelling stuff here between O'Reilly and Bailey. O'Reilly, I think, is trying to lift Bailey up. Bailey finds a way out. And that kick again. And Bailey unleashed out a lot of times. O'Reilly replying with the same thing. They are exchanging kicks here. And I would say that you've got to think Bailey would have the advantage here, but O'Reilly. I'm not so sure. Look at this. Yeah. God, this is brutal. Kick after kick after kick from Mike Bailey and Kyle O'Reilly who takes away the leg. More damage done to the left leg of Mike Bailey. Oh, back wow. Of the heel into the back of the skull of Bailey. And he does the same thing to O'Reilly. They're going hold for hold, strike for strike here. Where's the roundhouse kick? That's the roundhouse kick. Bailey, if he has enough energy to turn O'Reilly over and get the cover, could win it here. But he doesn't, Dave. He doesn't. Look, he is in the wrong part of town right here because he needs to be going towards the other part of the ring, not where he is, which is the ropes. Well, both men absolutely motionless for several seconds after they hit the mat. That's the problem with that roundhouse. It drives you into your opponent with such force it actually sends you spinning out the other way away from him. We are surely reaching the business end of this one now because these guys, both of them, are operating on fumes alone. There cannot be any gas left in the tank. Bailey knows that. He's going to try and end it here. O'Reilly doesn't know where he is. Bailey with the roundhouse. And he'll go for the, maybe he'll go for the shooting star. Oh, oh, it's good. oh. Then he gets caught, he gets caught into the arm lock from O'Reilly. 
rolls through. What's he trying here? O'Reilly gonna try and break the arm of Bailey. And his body weight's on top of him. Very hard for Bailey to move towards the ropes here. Using his left knee to strike the head of O'Reilly. I don't want to sound like one of those crazy guys standing outside on the street corner with a cup, but I sense the end is near. Armageddon is not far away, Dave Bradshaw. Oh, there's a brain buster, brain buster, and then all oh, nearly two. Oh, there he is! There he is! Oh. Well, this is how he won in the first round. I hope I've been good in this life. Who can? Can O'Reilly make lightning strike twice here tonight in Toronto? And he's twisted over into the ankle lock. Ankle lock by O'Reilly. Ankle lock. He submitted the best in the business with this ankle lock. Will he do it here to Bailey? Give credit to Bailey. He's hanging in there, but for how long? Well, he's inching towards the road. He's probably oh. pulled back in. Oh, that's it. I'm calling it. And O'Reilly, O'Reilly wrapping his body around that left leg. There is no way, Dave. Look how far he is from those ropes. Bailey. Oh, he thought about it. He thought about tapping. Will Mike Bailey tap out? Will Kyle O'Reilly go to the finals of the Pro Wrestling World Cup? He needs to tap out or he needs a miracle. So close, but so far away. Oh, oh he makes it. He makes it. Mike Bailey makes it and Kyle O'Reilly has to break the ankle lock. I don't usually believe in miracles, but that was one. Oh, oh. Oh, he's straight back in! Straight back in! Bailey! Oh, he fine. had to get out quickly there, and he did. God, that was smart. What an escape there by Mike Bailey. Carlo Riley on the outside, and Bailey setting up for... Oh, no. Dave, you know what? This looks like... We saw this earlier. Surely not. Surely not. Oh, my God! A moonsault! Moonsault off the second rope to the outside. How did he have enough power in the left leg to do that after the ankle lock? Unbelievable! Absolutely unbelievable. It looked like the end was nigh for Bailey, but man, this kid is impressive. If you are any promoter anywhere in the world, you want to be booking this young man because he has an incredible future ahead of him. But right now, all he can focus on, all we can focus on, is will he make it through to the finals of the WCPW World Cup? And for Armsat, this could go either way. Both men are outside at the moment, and the ref referee has a count on. I don't know what happens if... Uh, well, it's not going to happen anyway, but if there was a double count out, I don't know what happens to that second spot in the finals, but in any case, Bailey is in. Bailey's on the second rope. We saw this earlier. Maybe he's going for the shooting star. Knee drop. Oh. He is, but there's no one there. Oh, and he landed all that impact and force on his own knees. And look at this. O'Reilly with the... Almost a shining wizard there to try and take down Bailey. Bailey went dead weight to try and avoid it, but unfortunately he had nowhere to go for that knee. Oh, look, he's using a knee of his own to escape. Falls onto the top rope. Yeah, he didn't escape quite as much as he wanted to because he's still in a very dangerous position here as O'Reilly is uh, going to come back for more here and try and finish this off. O'Reilly, if he can hit something big off this top rope, Got to think that that's going to be all she wrote for Bailey. But Bailey finally finds a way out, kicks O'Reilly back to the mat, and now again Bailey ascending to the top floor. What's he going for here? Oh, oh! O'Reilly kicked the leg away. I don't know whether he lured him in or whether that was desperation, but either way, it worked for O'Reilly. He's going to go for the super place. Gets countered by Bailey. Oh, force and impact on that knee, and Dave, surely not. He's going for it. If he hits this, this is all. Oh my gosh! The shooting star knee drop by Mike Bailey, and Mike Bailey upsets Kyle O'Reilly to go to the World Cup Finals. Winner of this contest, Speedball Mike Bailey. We have seen some incredible action here in Toronto, but I'm going to tell you right now, the man that I believe the industry will be talking about coming out of this show is the man who's just earned himself a place in the finals, the one, the only, Mike Bailey. This guy is phenomenal.
All the credit in the world to Kyle O'Reilly to put in such a tremendous effort given the injury he had to his left knee coming in here. But you're right, Mike Speed Bailey Mike has just now announced his arrival to the Logan whole wrestling world. The whole world August. knows his name now. Congratulations. Bailey joins Michael Elgin as the representatives of Canada in the finals of the Pro Wrestling World Cup. And a sign of respect there from Kyle O'Reilly. They are pumped up in Toronto as they finally know the identities of their representatives in the World Cup Finals and one of them is Mike Bailey. Well, what an incredible way to end the matches here in the World Cup, but Dave Bradshaw, we are not done because we have one incredible showdown left. El Liguero takes on the WCPW Champion, Joe Hendry, in a non-title match, and it's coming up next. Yeah, Joe Hendry tomorrow will defend the title against Martin Kirby, but first, he has to get past the Mexican sensation here in Toronto. Can he do it? Our main event, coming up next, here in the World Cup Qualifiers. Ladies and gentlemen, the following contest is scheduled for one fall. And is your main event of the evening. Introducing first, from Los Sancho, Mexico. Weighing in at 183 pounds, he was the first ever WCPW Internet Champion the Mexican sensation, El Ligero. Well, as you just heard, El Ligero was indeed the first ever internet champion here in WCPW, but if he was to get a win here in this non-title match against the WCPW champion, Joe Hendry, that might put him right in contention for a title match. Indeed, and you know, being the former champion sometimes doesn't sound as impressive until you realize he lost that title to Cody Rhodes. Ligero has been in the ring with some of the best wrestlers across the planet, but right now he steps into the ring with the man in What Culture Pro Wrestling, and that man is the local hero, Joe Hendry, who is a, the local hero is a long way from home, but he might still feel heroic. That's the level of confidence that that leader of the prestige brings with him everywhere he goes now. Well, he's neither local nor a hero as far as I'm concerned. The, uh, the utter lack of compassion that Joe Hendry showed for Martin Kirby in winning that title was absolutely disgusting. One of the most disturbing things I've ever seen at ringside at a pro wrestling event. And was it me? Or Liguero was in the top of his entrance pose and suddenly Hendry's music cut straight in. Psychological warfare right from the offset in your main event. And his opponent from Edinburgh, Scotland. Weighing in tonight at 228 pounds. He is the WCPW champion. This is the prestigious one, 
Joe Hendry! Joe Hendry with that title belt over his shoulder, the thing he has craved more than any other prize in pro wrestling for the past year, and it has driven him to some places that I didn't think we would ever see Joe Hendry go to. Well, Dave, I've been saying from the beginning, I believe if Hendry harnesses that anger, that frustration, that disappointment, he could become a world beater. And unfortunately, it was at the hands of Martin Kirby, because you know I'm a big fan of, of the Kerbmeister, right? But Joe Hendry has become everything that I thought he could become. I mean, this guy is, he reminds me a lot of The Rock. Well, but look how Hendry's done it. Look how he's done it. He, he couldn't do it on his own, so he had to get a gang around him, the prestige. And now he won't shut up about it. In fact, he's got a microphone now, for goodness sake. Get on with the match. Doesn't matter if you win or lose, Dave Bradshaw, as long as you win. Bobby Heenan taught me that when I was a kid. Someone's got a puncture. The prestigious one has been having a little think. Because, let's be honest, let's just cut to the chase. Let's address the elephant in the room. You all know that I've been here in Canada before. And you know that I'm the prestigious one, but how about for one night, we have a little bit of fun? Now I know in a promo before I came here, I said that this would be a non-title match. But I've heard the passion of the Canadian fans, and I've made a decision about this belt tonight. What do you say, oh. folks? What? Oh, no way. of each and every single Canadian fan tonight. And I have decided that the WCPW Championship will never be defended in Canada. Charming. Isn't he a delight? It's a Let me puncher. tell you the reason. The reason is because you're some of the worst I've ever seen. You think this is an opera? Hey, hey, shut up when I'm talking. It's getting hot in here. That's what you call heat. Well, for these fans. You all think this is an opportunity for you to come out with your idiot friends and go 10, 10, 10, and too sweet. Like you think you're on the show. We get done. I run the show. Hendry is channeling the spirit of every veteran ever to rip into current independent wrestling fans. You people might not understand, but I'm on a crusade to save professional wrestling. That brings me to you, El Ligero. If you're not getting a shot at this championship title, then do you really want to risk your health by going against the prestigious one? Because I consider that getting in my way because I've got big plans for this championship title. I'm on a crusade to make this the most prestigious championship in all of professional wrestling. And you're not getting a shot, so you're getting in my way. And you know what happens to people who get in my way. You know what happened to Martin Kirby when I smashed his skull off the canvas Time and time and time again, he will never be the same. Oh, you're going to boast about that, are you? <laughs> Arrogance of this man is unreal. I concur. So before we get started, you need to realize that life is all about doing the right thing and you need to do the right thing. And I'm giving you the opportunity to walk away and preserve your health. One chance, Ligero. Walk away. What are you going to do, Ligero? Walk away. 
Well, Hendry's making this over to the Gero. Stop it. I'm not going to be quiet for him or for you. I want to see what's going to happen. Well, of course the Gero's not going to walk away. Stop it. Ah. Well, the Gero's understanding of English isn't... Oh, Davey hit with the belt before the bell. No. Genius. Well, that can't... Well, you can't start the match now. Why can't he? Come on, give me one re Get out your wrestling rules for dummies book. Tell me why he can't. Don't I hit your opponent with a championship belt. Probably rule number one. I tell you what, I'm not the kind of person to be an, a senseless cheerleader for anyone, but I'm <laughs> no, becoming never. a big fan of Joe Hendry. Of this attitude is... This is the attitude of champions, which is ironic because he is a champion. So it's obviously a champion's attitude. This... What happened? No! What oh, happened? Oh, stop doing that. What happened to Joe Hendry? What happened? Once a fan favourite here. What do you think happened? I, I... Let me tell you what happened. Joe Hendry, slowly but surely, saw all of these other people getting the opportunities because he was being too nice. You know the expression, nice guys finish last? You heard that one before? Yes. Well, not anymore. Not anymore. Is Joe Hendry going to finish last? He switched it. He changed the dial to another channel, and that channel is called the Channel of Champions. It's Joe Hendry's channel. Well, he's won the championship, but he's lost his soul in the process. As I said, what he did to Martin Kirby to win the title was absolutely vile. And El Ligero is feeling the wrath of this new, completely heartless Joe Hendry. The That's that's a good word. It is the wrath of Joe Hendry. I quite like that as a theme, as a concept. The wrath of Joe Hendry. And of course, Hendry might be on his own tonight, but often has backup with him. Now he's the leader of this group, the Prestige, with Joe Coffey and Travis Banks, and BT Gunn. The most prestigious group in British wrestling today, I hasten to add. Oh, look at this. Oh, he's going for the freak of nature to finish this early, and Liguero finds a way out. Despite being cold cocked by that championship belt at the start. Despite being what? Cold cocked. That's a phrase. That's why I don't pee outside in the snow. Liguero with the chop. He's so childish. Ridiculous. Liguero gets to the crossbody. Oh, freak of nature again. It's coming. Oh. Liguero lands on his feet. Great agility from the Luchador and Zaguri on Hendry. And again, don't forget Joe Hendry. Regardless of the outcome of this non-title match, going to defend that WCBW title in a rematch against Martin Kirby tomorrow on What Culture Extra as part of the event he is calling Hendry Mania. That's a catchy name. It's not a catchy name. Didn't like it when it was Kirby Mania, but at least Martin Kirby had some kind of basic human integrity. Uh, Kirby is going to be very much a fan favourite, you've got to think, even though Hendry will be in his hometown of Edinburgh at Hendry Mania. As uh, Hendry takes this into the crowd, back to your favourite part of the building. Lots of other action as well coming up from Edinburgh tomorrow on What Culture Extra. Gabriel Kidd, fresh off his successful internet title defence against Zack Sabre Jr defends against one of the hottest talents in Scotland, Kenny oh, look, Williams. That's talk about insult to injury. He smashed him with a giant Kirby sign. Sorry, carry on. Thanks. I didn't realize I needed your permission, but I will anyway. Oh, I was just doing color. I was giving color. It was a black and white sign. El Guerra, by the way, for his part, it's uh, also going to be part of Hendry Mania. He's taking on the massive Dave Mastiff. Is Joe Hendry going to be at Hendry Mania? I've just talked about that. Sorry, I was distracted by the sign. Several minutes. A forearm into the side of the head from El Ligero. And, oh, goodness me. Ligero into that bar, into the merchandise area. Oh, that's Joe Hendry's favourite part of the building. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he sells loads. Really popular guy, Joe Hendry. Joe Hendry's uh, stable mate in the prestige, Joe Coffey, is going to face Rampage. Uh, Hendry, mate, that's going to be an interesting showdown, to say the least, between two of the hardest hitters in the world. But 
you know, it all really does ultimately come down to the fate of that WCPW title. As much as I've had my differences with Martin Kirby, I would like nothing more than to see Martin Kirby take that belt from Hendry in Edinburgh tomorrow. You're such a flip-flopper. Look at this. Right. Oh, cross body. Onto the, oh, he's just bent that chair. Beyond recognition. It's a stall now. Ligero has, uh, with that cross body on the chairs, taken a distinct advantage here over the WCPW champion. <laughs> and Hendry is reeling. Ligero once again sends Hendry into the chairs. These fans need to get out of the way. This is a dangerous place to be when you've got El Ligero and the reigning champion, Joe Hendry, near you. Look at these chops from Hendry. That vicious streak coming out again. And that's where you can see, you know, interestingly, El Ligero has changed his attire. Normally those legs are covered and it almost created an optical illusion because now's the time you can see how much smaller El Ligero is to everybody else. You know, he looks so tiny in many ways, particularly when it comes to the legs, to Joe Hendry. And that's why Joe Hendry's able to manhandle the Mexican sensation, but that will change it. That will change it. El Ligero has never seen a platform that he doesn't want to dive off of. And believe me, this place is a dive. That's not very nice. Well, let's see how cheap the drinks are. It's about as polite to our Canadian hosts as Hendry was. Oh no, our Canada's a great place. Oh great, yeah. It's just his venue. Yeah. Oh, Corderas oh. takes a hit from Hendry. Ligero, the ace crusher. There's no referee. Ligero's gonna maybe go for the Mexican wave. And he hits it. Cover, one, two, three. Ligero should have just beaten the champion. This is absurd, where's the ref? Now that, come on. Ligero had, had Hendry beat. Well, I mean, it wasn't Hendry that hit the ref. I don't know what you're complaining about. This is a low oh. blow from Hendry. Disgusting. Ligero's in the fetal position there. Looks like a little lucha baby. Ligero left writhing in agony on the on the canvas after that low blow. This one should be over, and Ligero should have a win against the the prestigious one. And now he's got a chair. There's still no referee. Can we please get a second referee down here? If anyone in the back can hear this. Hendry is setting up that chair, wedging it between the top and middle turnbuckles. You going to condone this as well? Oh, I just think it's wonderful. I'd love to see Ligero try and humble break his way out of this one on Twitter tomorrow. Wonderful. Had such a great time in Canada being battered by the local hero, Joe Hendry. Oh, Ligero counters. Hendry tried to send him into the chair and another a low blow this time from Ligero will turn around his fair play and Hendry goes head first into the chair good good oh Ligero's going to the top maybe the Mexican wave a second time come on Hendry move ah oh. second time but there's no referee Dave Bradshaw El Ligero has had the WCBW champion beat oh. twice and oh. he won't do it here he, oh no Hendry got out Hendry got out Ligero has had this one, not once, but twice. And if that referee had been a split second earlier, he would have had it won officially as well. Can you imagine how it would feel if Joe Hendry went into Hendry Mania having lost his previous match before that show? It would feel great. There's no, what do you mean it would feel great? It would feel horrible. I feel horrible just thinking about it. A little bit of vomit came. Oh, look at Ligero. He preaches virtue. He preaches principle. And yet he's holding that chair. Well, Hendry brought it in. Oh, referee got clobbered again. Hendry pushed Ligero into the referee. That's what you get. The oh. shot from Hendry. 
disgusting. Liguero's out cold, and now he brings Corderas back into the ring. That's it, go back to Los Anchos. This one's over. Well, come on, not like that. Oh! Liguero gets out. Oh, come on. Henry can't believe that his underhanded, cheating tactics have not won him this. Liguero may have kicked out Dave Bradshaw, but the real question, which I'm pretty certain we're going to get an answer to shortly, is how much did that take out of the Mexican sensation? I would say everything he had left. Oh, he He's not moved. Yeah, he hasn't moved since, and, and Hendry is now dragging him. Basically, like a, a, a dead weight here to the outside. Why is he taking him to the outside? He can't win the match out there. He really hasn't moved. What's he doing? What is Hendry doing? Oh, not... Not, surely not a f oh, oh, I thought he was going to give him a freak of nature into the ring post. I was getting overly excited. Well, it wasn't uh, good news for Liguero anyway, so he went face first into the ring apron. Hendry's got something in mind, what's he? Oh, he set up some chairs. No, come on. Well, Liguero hit oh. that cross body through the chairs earlier, but... Dave, uh, I have Cameron a strange now. intuition about what we may just see. He's going to send Liguero oh. into the chairs, oh my! Spine first into the top of one of those chairs. Liguero is a crumpled heap on the arena floor. My intuition was a dead Liguero becomes a dead Liguero. That's pretty much what happened. There's no coming back from that one. And now Liguero really is motionless. Liguero starting to stir, but we know just how ruthless Hendry is. We know how much damage he did to Martin Kirby. If you're Liguero, just stay out. Stay out and live to fight another day. You can barely move. El Liguero, like a wounded animal, trying to make his way back to the ring. Referee's already up to a count of six. There was not four seconds left for El Aguero to try and make it back. Well, give credit where it's true. The Mexican sensation has got some heart and some fight left in him. But will it be enough to continue this match, let alone get back in the ring? He's a second away and he makes it. Aguero made it. Oh. He gives the middle finger to Hendry as well. Good for you, El Aguero. Not the best sign language he could have used in this predicament because he's going for the freak of nature and Aguero. Oh, oh, counter, oh. counter from Aguero oh. to beat Hendry. And he was he nearly did, but it was a, a, a half second short. Oh, C4L. He, get out of He got caught. He got caught. Aguero got caught by Hendry. Roll through into a sunset flip. Hendry will grab the arrow and he's got the, oh. the Hendry lock. The Look Hendry lock. Look at that. Look at that, Dave Bradshaw. Look at the champ. Dominant. In command. I mean, Liguero, Liguero's oh. ankle is being twisted. Oh, it's a right angle. Look at it. To a right angle, as in a curt angle. Well, we all know who invented this move, no matter what Joe Hendry will tell you. But Liguero, Liguero is going to. He's trying to reach the ropes, but Hendry is cinching down on what he calls that Hendry lock. This crowd firmly behind the challenger. And Liguero is just about at the ropes. Oh, oh no, he's not. Oh, that'll be interesting referee in there. Well, he should have, there should be a break, surely. Surely there should be a break. He touched the ropes. Oh. Liguero taps out. I told you. Disgusting. Come on, this contest. The prestigious one, Joe Hendry. Well, Hendry gets his victory. I'm sure he's very happy with himself, but... Don't say it so solemnly. The champ has proven why he has the gold right here in Canada. This is the point where you should say Joe Hendry deserves the championship and going into Hendry mania, the entire WCPW roster should be on notice because the local hero has never, and I mean ever, looked better. That's how you do it. Hang on a second. No, you've got your win. Perhaps he wants to shake his hand. Of course he doesn't. Liguero being put in the corner here by Hendry. What did referee get in there? Referee! This is what he did to Kirby. Oh, oh it's oh, Kirby! Here, here comes Kirby! Martin Kirby! 
comes to the rescue of El Ligero. And Hendry is running away like the coward that he is. Well, if Martin Kirby is the man standing tall in Edinburgh at the end of his title match with Joe Hendry, we may have a new WCPW champion. Martin Kirby is in hot pursuit of the champion as we head to Edinburgh and Hendry Mania. Right thing. You did the right thing. Wow. Oh, 